I'd like to welcome everyone and start off this evening with our commissioner's reports. Mr. Lejandro. Good evening. <clears throat> um, so during the last month, there was a PAC tech meeting on April the 19th. I was not able to go. I was out of town that uh, week, but um, I did get the minutes. The minutes uh, indicated that um, there were three uh, particular items uh, presented. Uh, the University of Virginia Athletics Master Plan update was discussed as, long as, a, as well as a draft phasing of the different athletic projects. Uh, the county presented an update on the three-notched trail planning. And then lastly, there were project updates by each of the agency representatives. Um, I wasn't there, but uh, Brian Hogg was, and he may have something to add to this that I have not covered or has other things. That, uh, that hits the highlights of the... Okay. <laughs> I, I, I would recommend looking at that three-notch trail proposal. It's really cool. So mm. if you have a chance to <laughs> look at something that the county's doing, it's a really nice project. Good. Did you want to mention the PAC, uh, full PAC meeting? I was going to do that when it came oh, to be my your, turn. Your turn. Okay. <laughs> uh, secondly, the HAC uh, Housing Advisory Committee Allocations Committee met on April 26th. Uh, we're reviewing uh, the Affordable Housing Fund application process. Uh, in, in, in essentially, we're working to simplify the application process, provide greater flexibility, and implement a committee selection process that includes affordable housing representatives. Uh, and then lastly, the Tree Commission met May 1st. I had to miss that because we gave our comp plan public presentation that night. That's it for me. Ms. Kelt? Uh, I'm not reporting this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Keysinger? Um, thank you. I have uh, three meetings to uh, report on um, to our Hydraulic and 29 Steering Committee uh, meeting. Uh, hold on, I'm just going back to my draft because I just typed them up and sent them to Carolyn like three seconds ago. So uh, we met on the 12th of April to uh, talk about some details related to the uh, Hydraulic and 29 plan. This is after the day that the Planning Commission had endorsed the small area plan in general. So obviously that the foundation of that plan is uh, consistent and moving through, but the consultants continue to try to refine some of the details at the pinch points on the edges of the work area. Uh, for instance, they're trying to improve right uh, hand northbound lane from uh, Hydraulic to 29. Uh, they considered an option for taking two, way, two lanes westbound under hydraulic under 29 to improve that flow. There was some discussion about the interface of hydraulic and Brandywine at that kind of uh, stretch that kind of moves around that curve and improvements to 250 and uh, hydraulic in general. Um, and then they gave us some options to review for bike lane options and connectivity at the hydraulic and 29 intersection proper. In the end, the committee uh, recommended that consultants look further at an option that connected all four quadrants at that intersection for bike pad and so I think they're continuing to look at that as we go on. The other meeting I attended was uh, <coughs> April 18th Emmett Streetscape meeting. Uh, that was the initial kickoff <coughs> meeting where the consultants uh, told us their observations of the existing conditions. They did a brief overview of the study process timeline and goals um, based on the smart scale application provisions. Um, they imagine a visioning process that will have three principles at its heart. One is a complete street, one is safety, and one is beautification of the corridor. Uh, this study basically runs from Ivy Road to Alderman, I'm sorry, Arlington on uh, Emmett Street. And then there was a group discussion about how to resolve one of the major questions the team will have to address, which is how to uh, provide a multimodal trail on that stretch of uh, Emmett, particularly at the pinch point where the train trestle is. There's an existing very narrow area there, and so some discussion of a tunnel and different things to move through that pinch point were the bulk of the conversation that evening. And then the last meeting uh, I'll report on is another Hydraulic and 29 Steering Committee meeting on the 26th of April. Uh, I couldn't attend it, but that discussion, as I understand it, related basically to how to package the different <coughs> projects within the work area into an application for smart scale. You'll remember there were eight projects that 
are kind of all interrelated ultimately, but not all can be funded at once. And so there's some discussion about what combination of those would be uh, put forward and when. And I'll, this isn't in my notes, Carolyn, but I just make a funny aside that we got an email from Mr. Emery lately that uh, talked about the the um, the pleasure it was to kind of see how quickly the hydraulic and 29 plan came together and how it might have benefited other parts in the city if those had been undertaken at dif different times and um, but it hasn't been that quick they've met for about 15 months and they meet every two weeks so it's it's been a fairly concerted effort um, you know I think the VDOT guys have done a super good job of organizing it in a way to keep it moving but it um, it wasn't an overnight thing, so I just wanted to throw that out, not to correct you, but it, these small area plans, I think, require that, but they, they could be done. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Santowski? I have nothing to report. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hogg, do you have a university report? Just a couple of things. Um, next week is the PAC meeting. And at that meeting, the UVA Foundation will be presenting their plans for demolishing the Cavalier Inn and beginning clearing the Ivy Corridor site. And um, my colleague, Michael Joy, will present an update on the Athletics Master Plan, the same presentation that was presented to Pat Tech a couple of weeks ago. Um, at the June Board of Visitors meeting, which is in early June, uh, there will be several items on the Buildings and Grounds Committee agenda. The Ivy Mountain Musculoskeletal Center <laughs> uh, will be presented for final approval. That's just over the city line um, in the county. It will be replacing the Kluge Children's Health, Health Center. I think demolition may have begun on that building already. And then the designs of the proposed addition and renovation of Alderman Library of the new softball complex and of the new student health building will be presented to the Buildings and Grounds Committee for review. Uh, student health is the next building that's planned for Brandon Avenue. It will be just on the east side of Brandon adjacent to the uh, dormitory complex that's under construction now. Thank you. Um, I did not attend <coughs> any meetings uh, as I didn't have any this month. Uh, with the exception of our comprehensive plan meetings. Um, but I am on a several committee steering committees so I wanted to discuss right at this time we still uh, we don't have another meeting for the Rivanna steering committee uh, set yet. Uh, the Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee will uh, meet on the 16th of May uh, at 7 p.m. at the Water Street Center. Uh, the East High Streetscapes project ha does not have another meeting set as of yet, but I highly encourage you to go to easthighstreetscape.org and take the survey and let your voice be heard there. This is a, a, an add-on to the Belmont Bridge as part of Smart Scale funding to uh, have the project extend all the way to 10th Street to, uh, uh, past the bridge. Uh, the Emmett Street Skate Project, as Mr. Kiesiger was just discussing, their next meeting is actually May 12th at the Cavalier Inn from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. This is a citizen information meeting. And then there's a walking tour that begins at 11. Did you mention that and I missed that? I didn't mention it, but I th there's a conflict with our comp plan session that right. morning, and I'll be at that. So. Well, well, yeah, we'll all be at that, but uh, for any citizens who doesn't want to participate in the comp plan or wants to participate in this, and then uh, at this time, I did not see any further future meetings scheduled for the industry. And that is what I have. Okay. Ms. Creasy, do you have a NDS report? I do. Um, we have uh, two comprehensive plan meetings this week. We've got one Thursday uh, from noon to two at City Space. Um, and then we have one on Saturday from 10 to 12, um, and that's at the Central Library on, in the McIntyre Room on the third floor. And these are two of the four that we have scheduled for the month of May, um, citizen participation for the comprehensive plan to gather feedback on the different chapters as well as to gather feedback on the draft map that the Planning Commission has put together. 
Um, following these meetings, the, the next one is May 29th, and that is in, um, in the Belmont neighborhood in the evening. Um, and we can get you more details on that if someone hears this and would like more information. Um, after that, the commission will be working with the comments that have been received and providing any sort of updates to materials and working forward through the comprehensive plan process. Um, the commission also has a work session on May 22nd on the calendar. Um, it doesn't have a specific topic to it, so I wanted to bring that to you all's attention to see if, uh, if you had a topic and or um, you wanted to take a break that night since we've got uh, four meetings this month <laughs> already. Um, it's kind of up to you all. Um, but we will need to figure that out pretty soon so we could get materials together if there's a specific topic you all want to work session on. I move that we dispense with the May 22nd work session. If I move, second, anyone? I'll second. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. <clears throat> um, uh, what are we going to do with ourselves? <laughs> Well, I'm going to a, to a meeting. <laughs> it was You're a not self, taking a break at It all. was a self-serving motion. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm certain that, that you all have spent more than an, enough of the, the time this month um, on planning commission duties. So um, we'll get geared up for many things in the summer, I'm sure. Um, so it sounds like May 22nd, folks are OK with not having that. Quick voice acclamation, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Not a problem here. All righty. Um, and that is all I have on the list here. Fantastic. That's up to you. Okay. Okay. So our next uh, item on the agenda is matters to be presented by the public, not on the formal agenda. So we do have two public hearings this evening, one for 227 Brookwood Drive, and the second one for uh, 1335, 1337 Carlton Avenue. If there's anything other than those things on the agenda that you'd like to speak about now, is your time to do so. <laughs> Mr. Emery's out of order. <laughs> Mr. Emery. <laughs> Where his crow is. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's anything other than 227 Brookwood Drive or 1335-1337 Carlton Avenue, now's your time to speak. Please come forward. You have three minutes. And I open the matters by the public. Seeing that there is no one wanting to speak about anything, I will close matters by the public and we can move to our consent agenda. Ms. Chair, I'd like to pull the entrance corridor so that we can have a presentation on that. In the interest of transparency, I don't have any particular issues with it. Okay. So we'll have a, um, ask the applicant to come in. Okay. All right. And I had a few questions on the minutes that we just uh, discussed in pre-meeting. Um, so what we'll do is move the entrance corridor review of 1000 East High Street Ready Kids. We will move that to the portion uh, when we open the entrance corridor review board uh, at, at the time of the 10th and high street uh, uh, corridor review would happen. Okay, so we have a few minutes until six where we are waiting on our quorum of council. That's fine. Mm -mm, nothing. We can do that. No. Um.
whatever. You want to do it? We can go ahead and handle a few more things of business this evening. Um, this evening, we have uh, two of our commission members uh, with their last, maybe ever, planning commission meeting. And it is going to be uh, really sad to see them go. I am happy that we at least have a PUD on the agenda for Mr. Santosky tonight as one of his going away <laughs> presents. I, I, I was going to wait, but uh, I wanted to thank you all for doing that. As, <laughs> because you, you all know how, how just excited I get every time we have a PUD on the agenda. So thank you, well, well, Madam Chair. <laughs> I, I didn't plan it, but I wish I had. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to uh, thank you all very much for your service and for your dedication and going through two comprehensive plan meetings, I mean, uh, uh, updates, uh, almost at the end of the second one. Not quite yet, but there's been a lot of hard work and you will definitely be missed. And we have a couple of things that we're going to, I want to present to you. So hang tight and come down there. Wait a minute. In the front? <laughs> You're in the front. Oh man, it's okay. I'm glad I took my shirt in. Yeah. <laughs> Should I do it last? Yeah. Okay. In case he shows up. Follow Lisa. I guess so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because we have a resolution for him. Tell me when to hit it. Hit it. Hit it. Okay. Whereas Mr. Kurt Kiesecker served on the Charlottesville Planning Commission from August 2009 to May 2018, serving as chair from September 2016 to September 2017, and vice chair from September 2013 to September 2016. And whereas Mr. Kiesecker served as the Planning Commission representative to the Board of Architectural Review, the MPO Technical Committee, the PAC Technical Committee, the UVA Master Planning Council, the Federation of Neighborhoods, the 250 Interchange Committee, the Small Area Plans Committee, the Hydraulic Planning Advisory Council, and the Streets That Work Code Audit Steering Committee, but not all at the same time. <laughs> and whereas Mr. Kiesecker used his professional experience as an architect to encourage high quality design within the Charlottesville community, and whereas Mr. Kiesecker provided many years of service and leadership to the Planning Commission, in preparation for an active participation in commission meetings. And whereas Mr. Kiesecker has been a key participant in the updating of two city comprehensive plans, often providing thoughtful and creative input along with accompanying visual materials, whereas Mr. Kiesecker has routinely gone above and beyond the typical duties of a planning commissioner to help draft a variety of planning documents and has served as a valuable resource for staff. Now, therefore, we, the City Council of the City of Charlottesville, do hereby thank Mr. Kurt Kiesecker for his years of dedicated service on the Charlottesville Planning Commission and wish him success in his future endeavors. Signed and sealed the 8th day of May, 2018. I have a little something extra that I think you all appreciate. Since we've had this comprehensive plan um, and we've met many, many Friday mornings at 7 a.m., um, and colored maps, and, and that is what we did. <laughs> I could not let you all go because I know that the, the withdrawals that you'll be having from that process. I have found these adult coloring books, and it is city maps across <laughs> the world. You all can plan your little heart's desire. You can continue planning the world, uh, land use wise. And, and I thought you'd enjoy that. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Whereas Mr. John Santosky served on the Charlottesville Planning Commission from August 2009 to May 2018, serving as chair from September 2015 to September 2016, 
And whereas Mr. Santosky served as the Planning Commission representative to the MPO Technical Committee, the School Board CIP Committee, the PAC Technical Committee, the Federation of Neighborhoods, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, the Budget Development Committee, the CIP Ranking Committee, the Belmont Bridge Committee, and the Free Bridge Area Congestion Relief Project. And whereas Mr. Santosky turned his concerns as president of the Fry Spring Neighborhood Association into responsible action by joining and leading the Planning Commission, and whereas Mr. Santosky provided many years of service to the Planning Commission in thoughtful consideration of the items presented to the Commission for review, as well as a forceful advocate for fully considered development proposals, and whereas Mr. Santosky has continuously been mindful of the impact of development decisions on underserved populations within the Charlottesville community, and whereas Mr. Santosky has been an advocate for existing neighborhoods within the city and, and has consistently encouraged his fellow commissioners to consider the impact on areas adjacent to new development. Now, therefore, we, the City Council of the City of Charlottesville, do hereby thank Mr. John Santosky for his years of dedicated service on the Charlottesville Planning Commission and wish him success in his future endeavors. Signed and sealed the 8th day of May, 2018. And, and we have one more. Um, Mr. Corey Claiborne is not present, but we at the at this time. But we would we would like to honor him as well with these words, and we'll make a presentation when we're with him at another time. Whereas Mr. Corey Claiborne served on the Charlottesville Planning Commission from March 2016 to March 2018, serving as vice chair from September 2017 to March 2018. And whereas Mr. Claiborne served as the Planning Commission representative to the Board of Architectural Review, and whereas Mr. Claiborne utilized his professional expertise in design upon joining the Commission to thoughtfully evaluate development proposals within the city, and whereas Mr. Claiborne provided years of service to both the BAR and Planning Commission in preparation, meeting attendance, and sharing his professional expertise, and whereas Mr. Claiborne has shown commitment to conveying the work of the Planning Commission to the public by representing the Commission in public meetings on numerous occasions, and whereas Mr. Claiborne has been and continues to be a leading advocate for public service in the field of architecture, both in his time on the Planning Commission and as a resident of the Charlottesville community and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, th therefore, we, the City Council of the City of Charlottesville, do hereby thank Mr. Corey Claiborne for his dedicated service on the Charlottesville Planning Commission and wish him success in his future's endeavors. Signed and sealed the eighth day of May, 2018. Well, thank you. with all of that, we have a, still have an agenda for this evening. And it seems as if we have two council members. Mm -hmm. I hesitate to let you all take a five minute break so that you do not wander off and get to talking, but we will take a break and I'll round up council. So adjourn for five minutes.
Okay. So when it comes time, this one. Little right. Yeah, that ready gets. Yeah. Okay. And, um, Will we have a corn? One, two, three. Mm -mm. Yep. Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah. John's here. And, um, Call us back into session, and I would ask that council call into session. The city council is called into session. Thank you. And so our the first item on the agenda for public hearing is SP0006-227 Brookwood Drive. Landowner Diane Anderson has submitted an application pursuant to city code 34-420 seeking approval of a special use permit for this property to authorize a family day home for up to eight children on the subject property. The subject property is further identified as tax map 25A, parcel 27. The subject property has an area of approximately 0.28 acres and has a zoning designation of R1S, low density residential small lot. The subject property contains a single family dwelling used for residential occupancy by the applicant. The city's comprehensive plan and land use map for both call for the area to be used for developed, to be used and developed for low density residential purposes and densities no greater than 15 units per acre. Stealth. Matt Alfley, city planner, neighborhood development services. Chair, I, th I think you actually gave the report. Um, there's not much to add beyond that other than the applicant um, is here tonight to uh, spoke to them. She can answer questions she doesn't want to present, um, okay. which I can understand. <laughs> and uh, so she's looking to do, she's run a, day, a family day home there. She's looking to increase up to eight children. Um, she has 30 years of experience, and I can tell you the only inquiries I have received and staff has received is if she is taking clients. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and you don't wish to make a presentation. Okay. So we'll ask questions at this time, and then we'll open the public hearing before we deliberate. So at this time, uh, are there any questions for, Mr. Uh, for staff or the applicant? Uh, Mr. Offley, did, did you observe any uh, particular or unique traffic considerations for drop-off and uh, pick-up of, of children? Uh, at this location, that's been an issue we've discussed with similar applications in the past. So when I did my site visit, it was it was not during. Speak to this application. Then I will close the public comment and open this up for discussion. I'm prepared to make a motion for approval with conditions. I. I move to recommend approval of this application for a special use permit for the subject property in the R1S zone to permit a family day home with the following listed conditions recommended by staff, um, limiting the number of children to a maximum of eight, limiting the operation hours from 7 to 5.30 p.m., and I'm adding a condition that there be um, a, a, on file with the city uh, a plan for the drop-off and pickup of children uh, exiting uh, and entering cars and that that be provided annually to all of the um, uh, parents whose children are attending this facility and that as a new child joins it, it be provided to that family as well. A second. I might like to add a friendly amendment which we discussed in pre-meeting. Uh, this uh, takes this to a, another level, and while I know that this applicant has a state license, um, if, since a special use permit goes with the land and not the applicant, if this were to ever change hands for any reason, this special use permit would still be active, that we add a condition that um, 
where, when applicable, the, uh, uh, the there's a. You had noted that there um, there would be a requirement for state licensure as right. required. Yes. Sorry. So to add a, uh, a, con a condition to uh, require state licensure from the DSS w when required. It's required from the state. From the um, state. Because you all determined, it, it was determined that, that it may be some other regulating agency in the future, and, and if it's the state, then it'll be the state regulatory, whichever one they choose it to be. Okay. I would just say that the, the daycare will be licensed as may be required by state law. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that? Licensing the daycare um, um, will be licensed as may be required by state law. So if no state law requires a license, they yes. can still operate without one. Or, or could we amend that further to say by applicable by state or other applicable law? It would be in, in case it's only get, it's it going to be will state. only be state. Daycare but we don't know what there could be in the future. Right? Then that just covers it all. I don't, you know. No? You could say by applicable laws. Yeah. That'd be fine. I like that. Okay. Would you accept that friendly amendment the, as wordy as it is? I, I would accept it, but I think we all have to accept it mm -hmm. by acclamation. So. We have to. There's no, we, have, we have a motion and a second. Second, right. But don't so, we all, by acclamation, have to approve an amendment? Because the amendment belongs to the commission, not to the person making the motion. Is it? Go for it. Okay. okay. Uh, so, by voice acclamation, approve, um, approve the friendly amendment. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we have a motion, a second, and an amendment to add uh, the terminology about uh, applicable requirement of a license. So, any further discussion? Ms. Creasy, would you call roll? Mm -hmm. Mr. LaHondra? Aye. Ms. Keller? Aye. <coughs> Mr. Sintowski? Aye. Mr. Kiesecker? Aye. And Ms. Green. Aye. Motion passes. And Our thank name. you. Thanks. Thank you. I will say, Madam Chair, that one thing I have heard recently is that there is a lack of child care in the city. And the more that we can add some of these things, I think it's moving us in the right direction. So thank you. Second up today, ZM 18-0002, uh, 1335 and 1337 Carlton Avenue, Carlton Views PUD. Hydro Falls LLC, Carlton Views 1 LLC, Carlton Views 2 LLC, and ADC 5, 4 Seville LLC landowners have submitted an application pursuant to city code 34-490 um, seeking a zoning map amendment to change the zoning district classifications of the following four parcels of land 1335 carlton avenue tax map 56 parcel 430 1337 carlton avenue tax map 56 parcel 431 Tax map 56, parcel 432, and tax map 56, parcel 433. Together, the subject property. The subject property has frontage on both Carlton Avenue and Franklin Street and are further identified on city real property tax map 56, parcels 430, 431, 432, and 433. The entire development contains approximately 4.855 acres or 200. 11,483 square feet. The uh, application purposes, 
proposes to change the zoning classification of the subject property from M1 industrial to PUD, planned unit development, subject to proffered development conditions. The proffered development conditions include affordable housing, providing affordable and accessible housing for no less than 20 years in the following ratios. <coughs> Minimum 30% affordable units for residents earning 60% AMI. Minimum 15% of all affordable units for residents earning under 40% AMI. Two, building design elements. Minimum 50% of all affordable units uh, designed to meet UFAS guidelines for accessibility. And minimum 30% of all affordable units designed to meet VHDA guidelines for universal design. Entrance feature on all buildings fronting Carlton Avenue. And three, maximum height of buildings shall not exceed 65 feet. Four, parking. No additional parking over required city <coughs> minimums. Outdoor lighting shall be full cutoff. <coughs> Bus stop or shelter if deemed feasible by CAT. And five, environmental site design, retaining tree canopy on east side of property adjacent to Franklin Street and pedestrian linkages between buildings and open space and the neighborhood. The PUD development plan for this proposed development includes the following key components. Approximate location of existing buildings and building envelope for future buildings. A phasing sequence of the development, phase one, the PACE Center, completed. Phase two, Carlton Views Apartments, completed. Phase three, Carlton Views Two Apartments. Phase four, Carlton Views Apartments. According to the PUD development plan, the total proposed density of the projects, all phases, will not exceed 32 DUA, dwelling units per acre, for a total of 154 dwelling units. The PUD development plan contains details required by city code, including a mixed, a use matrix for each phase, setback slash yard requirements for each phase, parking calculations for residential uses, open space, landscaping, architectural elements, and signage. The city's comprehensive plan and land use map calls for the area to be used and developed for business and technology uses. The comprehensive plan contains no <coughs> residential density range for the subject property. Mr. Alfie. Matt Alfley, City Planner, Neighborhood Development Services. So bear with me through this. If you can't hear me, please let me know. Commissioners, tonight you are reviewing an application for rezoning of four parcels near the intersection of Carlton Avenue and Franklin Street from the existing MI to planned unit development PUD. The rezoning request is part of a large part of a larger development that started back in 2012. The first phase of the development was the completion of the by right Blue Ridge Pace Center located at 1335 Carlton Avenue. Completed in the summer of 2014, the PACE Center, which is Program of All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly, offered, offers health care and health-related services designed to keep individuals living in their homes and communities for as long as possible. The center is run as a partnership between Riverside Health System, the University of Virginia Medical Center, and the Jefferson Area Board for Aging, uh, serving seniors who live in the Charlottesville and surrounding counties. Sir, uh, services offered by PACE include medical care, nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, which I have to give a shout out, uh, wife's an occupational therapist, um, nutritional services, medical, social work services, and home health care. Over the last four years, the PACE Center has provided a much needed service to the community. In 2013, phase two was started in order to create the residential aspect of the development. In May of that year, City Council passed a special use permit allowing the maximum residential density of 21 dwelling units per acre for the MI zone parcels. This laid the groundwork for a 54 unit apartment at 1337 Carlton Avenue, known as Carlton View 2, or excuse me, Carlton View 1. In July 2015, the final site plan for Carlton View 1 was approved and construction was completed in early 2017. At the time of this public hearing, all 54 units are rented out to residents making under 60% AMI. Phase three of the development started in the summer of 2017 
and a preliminary site plan for 40, a 48 unit apartment building known as Carlton View 2 was approved by the Planning Commission on January 10, 2018. In early 2018, City Council awarded the developer $1.44 million for acquisition of the site for affordable units. Once completed, all 48 units will be rented out to residents making under 60% AMI. Currently, the final site plan for Carlton View 2 is awaiting the posting of bonds before construction begins. At the completion of Phase 3, Carlton View 2, the development will have exhausted all available density under the SUP. As the zoning ordinance only allows 21 dwelling units per acre for the MI district, the developer needs to, to rezone all four parcels to increase density if they want a residential building for Phase 4. The developer does not have the option of only rezoning the last remaining parcels. That would remove acreage from the existing parcels, making them non-conforming. In order to fulfill phase four of the development, the applicant is pursuing a rezoning of all four parcels to PUD. The MI district was established to allow areas for light industrial uses that have a minimum of environmental pollution in the form of traffic, noise, odors, smoke and fumes, fire and explosive hazards, glare and heat and vibration. Most uses allowed within the zoning district can be uh, are commercial and industrial by nature with limited residential uses allowed. The 2013 Conference of Plan land use map indicates the subject properties remain business and technology. Business and technology is described as properties that would permit small scale offices that cater to startup businesses and technological development, as well as commercial activities that does not generate the amount of traffic that can be found in more consumer oriented commercial areas. The applicant is requesting a rezoning of, of the subject properties to PUD to accommodate a high density development, uh, than higher density development than the current 21 dwelling units per acre allows. The 2013 Comprehensive Land Use Plan does not designate areas that would uh, neatly conform to a PUD type development as they are special zoning uh, designation. The closest land use description from the 2013 plan would be mixed use. Mixed use in the 2013 land use plan is described as areas intended to be, to, to be zones where the city encourages development of moderate or high intensity and where a large variety of uses will be permitted, including many commercial uses, residential uses, and some li limited research and manufacturing where appropriate. According to the development plan's uh, use matrix, Uses permitted within the PUD would be consistent with most of the current MI uses, with some exclusions and additions. All the non-residential industrial uses have been removed as, allowed, uh, as allowable uses, such as construction storage yards, kennels, and self-storage companies. The main use proposed in the development plan are multifamily and non-residential. The applicant in indicates the total allowable unit count for the development to be 154 units and a total non-residential build out of 50,000 square feet. Currently the site is util utilizing 20,000 square feet for the PACE Center and 102 residential units. That leaves a total of 30,000 square feet for non-residential and 52 residential units remaining for development. Residential units could be sp spread throughout the site but the non-residential uses will be limited to phase one, 30,000 square feet maximum, phase two, 7,500 square feet maximum, phase three, 5,000 square feet maximum, and phase four, 7,500 square feet maximum. The use matrix provided in the development plan indicates non-residential uses as commercial, retail, and general. Although the plan, the PUD use matrix and the MI use matrix correspond in many areas, relating to a lot of the commercial and residential uses, they do differ in a few key ways. The PUD use matrix removes all industrial uses currently allowed in the MI districts. While the residential aspect of the site, this is a reasonable alteration to make, but one planning commission should focus on. The city has limited industrial areas and a rezoning this size would remove close to five acres of potential, potential industrial development. Residential treatment facilities, bank financial institutions, and private clubs are uses within the PUD matrix that are not permitted, but are permitted in the MI use matrix. Planning Commission should give some thought to the uses uh, to ensure they are appropriate for this location. 
Should the rezoning be approved, the overall density for the site will increase from the SUP maximum 21 dwelling units per acre to a maximum of 32 dwelling units per acre. Under the future land use map definition, the density is considered high density residential. It should be noted that regardless of the zoning, the subject properties are already high density residential based on the 21 dwelling units per acre and the type of existing housing on site. Um, in addition to myself, our housing coordinator Stacy's here to answer questions too. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like a glass of water? <laughs> oh, I can wait for a minute, thank you. Questions for staff? <clears throat> I, might, <clears throat> I might have one or two. Um, and I want to thank Matt for bringing this PUD to me. I, I had a look back, and, and I, I think the first PUD that, that I had a chance to, to look at was the William Taylor Plaza, <laughs> which these many, many years later still bothers me, along with some of the other PUDs. Um, and I thought, well, maybe tonight I'll just not ask any questions and improve a PUD right off the starting block, but I can't do that. So I, ha I have a couple of questions, and maybe you can help. Um, why? I guess we're, we're going from 50 to 65 feet in height because of the increased density? We can't stay at 50 as under the SUP? So that, if you, on the, uh, <clears throat> near the end of the staff report, uh -huh. there's a chart. And that chart, so... <clears throat> The how the city defines height changed um, after this SUP was approved. Okay. So there is kind of a um, new definition, and that's in that chart. So that's sort of the explanation for why there's a why the SUP condition was altered in the proffer statement. Okay. Um, the other thing is, I think I saw in your notes, and I know we saw this in at least one of the comments, is that there were certain assurances and there was even something about three bedrooms being the maximum, but there was no proffer. But my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong and, and we could get some help here, is that if it's in the PUD document, then that that's stays in place. But I don't know if that applies to bedrooms or if that's just more with the, the land use. So in the SUP, that was um, condition three. The number of bedrooms in any dwelling unit on site shall not exceed three bedrooms. Right. They, uh, the applicant did not proffer that. So that. But, no but what I'm saying is that we do we have to have it proffered, or can we say it can't exceed three bedrooms as this, part of the PUD development, since the PUD is a little bit more flexible. The really the documents in front of you are what the applicant has provided. I, um, I, I understand, but I think we can still, we can modify those as we approve a PUD. I you know can, we can't at all. You can mm -hmm. identify that a certain thing would, would um, uh, there would be impacts uh, to the site and to the community based on a certain thing, and um, <clears throat> that would be the only way to... Um, because I think I remember us having the discussion that if it's not in the PUD document, then there's always the possibility that the applicant can come back and change that in the future, such as William Taylor Plaza, where we really truly didn't uh, define what residential meant. So the world has changed, um, and uh, we have the proposal from the applicant um, for the PUD mm -hmm. um, with proffers that they have provided to us. Um, and uh, if there are impacts that you all feel are not addressed um, in the application that's before you, then you can provide those impact statements um, to the applicant and allow them to have that information. Okay. And, I, and two, I think there's um, if you look at there's attachment F, uh, which is kind of the comparative use matrixes, um, you kind of get a feeling of what could be allowed or what would definitely not be allowed. And under dwellings, they have not only the multifamily, but within all the phases, single family attached, single family detached, townhome, and two family. Um, I'm sure when the applicant speaks, they could maybe talk to why they don't have a bedroom count and it might have to do with what they are allowed. Yeah, to the metrics. other thing that I had a question on was that in the original U SUP, there's some mention of assurances that were given during the Carlton One 
um, or the Carlton to whatever Carlton views the first phase of it that there were going to be market rate apartments built into it and all and I'm not sure if that still stands within the PUD there was nothing in the SUP I mean it might have been a conversation well, I think it was a conversation that was or a conversation or perhaps it was something I, I'm not sure how it was relayed but the information appeared to be that there were some assurances given to neighbors and things like that so that it wasn't a totally low income neighborhood that was going to see either stress the neighborhood stress the schools or you know stress the community at large that we're really looking at that mixed um, um, market low income affordable housing mix that we were looking for in a lot of other places so I don't know if that still exists or it doesn't exist or well it, I'm it, just kind of whistling in the dark well it never so it never existed in the doc in what was sure. documented uh -huh. Uh, there could have been conversations, but any staff or planner that would have came across these documents You would not have seen that, okay. Would not have seen it. It wouldn't have been something that could have been enforced. Do we know what their intentions are for the other phases if we approve the PUD? Do they in intend to include market rate apartments? So the what's being they're proposing would be just like uh, Carlton View 1 and 2, so it would be uh, un affordable units. And I, and I can let Stacy speak to this. It has more to do with scale. Of how the funding works um, I mean that's really what prompted this development was they wanted to do another Carlton view mm -hmm. and to do it at that that scale for funding they had to do the whole unit and they, but they can't do the density because they've run out of density now they're not precluded from doing market rate if if this was to go into place and their funding fell through they couldn't do Carlton view 3 they could do market rate units, um, because, um, but they still would need the density. And the reason that they can, that I know you said that they can't, once they build out the SUP, no longer allows for the increased density, and so it becomes non-conforming. Is that a terrible thing? It's not allowed. I mean, it, it, so the, the biggest problem they're running into is the, the, the lots. It's because of the dwelling units per acre, how you do the calculation. If you tried to rezone even just one parcel, you suddenly made the other two, three parcels non-conforming because they're, they're suddenly now above the 21 dwelling unit per acre, probably closer to, that lot's a fairly big lot, so they're probably closer to 40. <coughs> even though the count didn't change, the unit count didn't change, their DUA went way up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll let somebody else ask a question. Matt, um, with the application and the narrative of um, proffers, there's a um, development PUD application plan um, that is graphic and it has a lot of information that's important to me as an architect. Um, how much can we rely upon this and the information in it um, to represent what will be there uh, in the ultimate plan? So the attachment B, which is the development plan, which would be part of the proffered uh, development plan. So this would be if, and again, five years, someone came in with an application to do something here, the staff would go to this document. Um, they would go to uh, this document, which is attachment C, their development um, narrative, and this document to see if it was allowed. What you have now is you have the footprint for phase one and two. So if someone wanted to build, tear down the pace center, build it closer to the road, they could not without amending their PUD. Uh, same goes for phase two, the apartments. Phase three and phase four have more of a envelope. Um, if you'll notice, they have the, where they could build within. And so those, those two phases are a little more where you look at the use matrix, look at the document, um, an example would be is if phase four, they wanted to do townhomes, and they could do townhomes within that building envelope, and it's allowed within the use matrix, and they can park it per the development plan, that would be allowed. Uh, but if they wanted to do anything that would be outside that envelope, they would need to amend the PUD. Uh, not, not to bring up William Taylor Plaza, but very similar um, development plan where they had buildings and they had a use matrix and they could do the uses within those buildings but the footprint couldn't change. That footprint had to stay what was the same as the development plan. 
And does that apply to the parking and the um, driveway system? It does definitely for phase one and phase two. If you touch, touch mm -hmm. any of that, you're gonna have to amend it. There is a little room um, to work out some of the details for phase three and four uh, in that regard, but they would still need to reach the, um, how, they're, how they're doing their, if they're gonna do residential, how they're doing their residential parking. If they were gonna do commercial, um, it's noted in the report, their parking would have to meet city standard parking. The only alterations they're making for that is on the, if it's for residential. And for phase one and two, the building locations and the parking and the driveways and the bioswells and the, the stormwater retention areas, that's all as it exists now? Correct. Thank you, ma'am. I have several questions, unless Mr. Kiesiger. Uh, go ahead, I'll follow you. Um, the height for, so a couple of things. This is built, I live close by, I can see it, and this is built, correct? Yes. And then uh, Carlton 2 is approved. It's approved, bonds have not been posted. So, but it's approved. Yeah, the review is finished. And, and I understand the PUD is enabled to enable this Carlton 3 to happen. Am I, that, that is correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and the 65 feet due to our change in how we measure building height <coughs> would mean that due to the terrain on that site that 65 feet would actually not be taller than the 50 foot building that's already there on Car at Carlton 1. If I read this uh, application correct is this is this accurate? <coughs> I mean, I know it's a very slim, but I did go out and look on site. Have we done, is that, maybe I should ask the applicant. That, yeah, that, I'm not sure I can answer satisfactory. Okay, because there's a good drop there. The, the elevation, I mean, there's, you have that big wall, mm -hmm. and then so the back of the site is definitely higher than the front. Right. Um, <coughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't see any topo numbers that I could actually read at this age. I mean, it, so you would have, so you would measure um, how our definition is now is from grade to the highest point of the building. So I would think you would go from the lowest grade right. to the highest point of the building. Okay. Instead of doing the averaging like we used to do. Right, right. Okay. Which would probably make the building smaller because <coughs> you would measure the back, which sits up on grade, but that grade's a story and a half above right. the front. Right, right. And that's why I was looking at, okay, I'll ask the applicant. Um, and so could you define uh, low income versus affordable? Because I don't know that I necessarily No, I cannot. I will income. turn that over to Stacy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stacy Pathy, a housing program coordinator for the city of, of Charlottesville. Um, so could you repeat your question one more time? Uh, there was a question about all of this being low income, but I guess as I read it, I did not see this as low income and maybe I, I read it as affordable, 60% AMI. And Correct. So can you define what low income would be? Um, so when it comes to um, federal affordable housing definitions. Uh, they, they're really based on income. And so extremely low income would be any family earning uh, with household incomes of 30% of very median income or less, uh, which at the moment I believe um, the area median income for Charlottesville is about 86,000, uh, it's average, $86,000. So For a family of four? For a f yeah. that, that's just straight across. Oh, okay. Um, they do adjust it. This way it becomes difficult without my chart. Um, they adjust the income levels by household size. Okay. So for a single person household, extremely low income is about $17,000 household income. Mm -hmm. um, low income would put you at the 50% area median mm -hmm. income. Um, and this would then serve, uh, that's very low income, and this would be low income, which is 60% area median income. Um, and that varies by household size. So 60% and 40% is what's on this project, right? Correct. OK. OK. Thank you. And mm -hmm. Mr. Albert, one quick other question. With uh, all of the proffers that are listed here, as well as this matrix uh, in the packet, 
So not just this plan, which is listed as the concept plan, which is part of the proffer, attachment B, right? Is this uh, matrix attachment F, would that be also a part of the proffer? So if anything were to change from this matrix, the PUD would have to be? Yes, but not, not attachment F. F was, is for you all to see a comparative. There's an, a, a matrix in attachment C, which is the development document. Right. Has a matrix in it. This is just to help you all understand what changes. They're, they modeled the matrix after the MI. Mm -hmm. And so this attachment really is just for you all to understand what has been removed or added in comparison. So when you mentioned uh, commercial, it would be only the commercial that has been listed through the proffer, right? Through the development plan use matrix, right. correct. Okay. okay. Which is... Okay. That's all it Starts on page 21 of the development plan document. One last question. I'm sorry. Uh, with the zoning, um, as this is as it is now, and it does back up across the tracks, uh, and that would be <coughs> business and technology, what it's currently zoned. Uh, if this PUD were to pass as it is, uh, would it be considered uh, high density residential? And would it be orange or would it be considered yellow? It, so, from my understanding, it would still be business and technology. Yeah, it, it, yeah it would have to be changed in the land use map. Okay, okay. In the zoning, uh, it would just go from MI to PUD. Okay, okay. <laughs> Matt, one question to follow up on what Lisa had to say about the uh, use matrix. So, just kind of curious in general, what goes into that PUD document that will follow the PUD for the future use? Be and I, I guess the reason I talk about the zoning matrix is that if in the future the zoning matrix changes, does this zoning matrix apply or does the new zoning matrix apply? The, the, the matrix in this is what's going to apply. Any so change then to this zoning should will be not attached to the PUD. It is. It's in the development. So it is. What no, no, I guess I just want to make sure so that because we've had it happen in the past where when we've looked for PUD documents, most recently thinking about the one out on Fifth Street, there was a lack of documentation within the public files about what exactly what, what that PUD document was. So I want to be sure that a future planning commission can say if they don't develop phase four for 10 years or eight years or so that that document sits there and even with all the changes that might come out of the comp plan and zoning matrix and all that this applies to that PUD. Yes, and that's in, in staff is well aware of that frustration um, where you go and so I, I will say in your deliberations there's a there's the component of of the land use of the zoning there's also the component which i do think i commend the applicant on is they provided a really good document as far as it, if someone in 10 years comes along they're going to have this document and you would really know what you can and cannot do on this parcel and that has not always been the case we have we have had that issue uh, with older puds mm -hmm. okay. go ahead um, the proffers for the affordable units mentions that 30% will be affordable to under 60% AMI and 15% will be affordable to under 40% AMI, but those two numbers aren't cumulative. There's, it's basically the proffers 30% affordable units. Correct. And, which means 70% market rate or it, above 60%. It could be. So even they, they would have, um, not. Stacy might have to chime in on this. I don't want to say they've either <clears throat> met, they've already met this proffer regardless, or they would meet it with phase two. So, um, and then the, the use matrix allows for other uses that are not residential. We've already talked about there's commercial uses and medical, which obviously makes sense for pace, but the parking reduction to 35%. So I'm trying to get a handle on how much affordable housing is really on the table because it's possible, not probable, but possible some other use besides affordable housing could be built of a commercial nature. And this is a percentage of units affordable. It's not an absolute number. So if only 90 units get built, 
something less than 30 affordable units is all that would have to be required, right? Uh, yes, I mean, they, so it is a percentage. Um, so, but that percentage would be of the hypothetical 154 max units. If they build 154 units, but they may not, they could build the fourth building all office. They could. If they could park it. If, if they could park it under current code. So it's the proffer has, uh, I just wanted to understand the proffer is not an absolute number. Obviously, it's a percentage of however many housing units get built. Correct. And I believe uh, staff points that out under the housing section, too, in the staff report. Okay. And um, the calculation of open space as it pertains to what we see in the development plan or plan of development, is it... Um, how does one determine, and this may be a question for the applicant, is the determination of open space the differential between total site area minus impervious area equals open space? There is a little bit of, so how open space in the PUD ordinance is written, it talks about things you have to preclude, uh, which is impervious, the parking areas, and then it lists things that you can include, picnic areas, and then things for scenic value. So I think there is kind of a calculation you can do I think ideally you you want to set aside well thought out open spaces but the code does leave you that option to go that route of okay I can I'll have to preclude this I can include this what does my numbers come out to be okay and um, I think that's all my question the rest will be for the applicant thank you So at this time, we'll have the applicant. Do you I, have a question? I, um, I, I, go ahead. No, no, no. You, um, I, I saw um, a lot of language about um, the frail, elderly, and disabled, um, and, and I found the percentages for uh, percentages of income. Uh, but I didn't see a proffer, maybe it was and I missed it, and maybe you could clarify that, uh, about whether these units or what percentage of units will be universally accessible. Is that one of the, is that one of the proffers? Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it is? Okay. Yes. I just wanted to verify that. Um, it's on page 24. Okay, great. Thank 24, you. 20, 22 okay, so of 24. <laughs> it spells out the, the current versus versus the proposed, and it's it's included with the AMI. It notes the accessible as well as universal design. Okay, so that seems like a really important characteristic that, that we would want some surety about. Mm -hmm. uh, a few months ago, we had a presentation from the school board, and we talked about more coordination, and I wondered if there was any <coughs> conversation or assessment from them on uh, the effect, perhaps, on the um, school uh, assignment for potential residents here there was not other than it, housing is open to all they, there could be um, but I mean was there a conversation with the with the schools and if so would that affect perhaps some plan about the uh, ratio of, of housing types and number of bedrooms and that sort of thing no okay thank you um, I had one more question question and also uh, sort of to pick up on Jody's earlier question um, we only have verbal descriptions of of, of, of what the future uh, buildings will be but we don't have any graphic uh, representations of those other than the site plan is that correct correct and it's noted in the report that no architectural drawings were submitted with the application so we don't have any degree of specificity or surety there no other either. than just the applicant wanting to keep the architectural style similar to what was built um, but again as no that's there, kind of left to interpretation yeah. at the time that this comes in and how would that determination be made would that be made by staff or would it come to a, a planning commission at a future date well I think if they because there's nothing very specific in here and it that talks about we're going to use X style, um, I think there would be room to interpret. Um, now, I'll, of course, defer to the department and legal whether uh, I probably couldn't give you a great answer. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we got that, we probably would have to talk to 
uh, legal department and know does this fit within what was approved? Again, we'll use that 10 years from now, someone submits an application. Does this application fit within the requirements of this PUD document? And if not, would, you know, what would they need to do? Would they need to amend it? Um, but because of the lack of architectural speak in there, I can't really give a good answer. So it was really just these footprints that you mentioned earlier. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And I just want to be, be sure I'm clear, following up a little bit on Kurt. So the applicant may have already hit their targets for affordable housing? Yes, because it is a, it is a percentage. Um, let me find that page. Well, no, I guess my question was, so then if they didn't want to provide any more affordable housing, they could make it all market rate housing? Correct. Okay, so there is no... There's no guarantee in there that there'll be more affordable housing than what there is right now. No, other than, and again, the applicant can probably speak to this, other than the funding for how they have to do these units, which is not right. being able to do one or two units. They have to come in and do 40 or 50 units to right. get the funding. Okay. But if some other group, were, if there were to be a delay and if some other group did it in the future, they wouldn't, they Correct. wouldn't be this, held to that. If this fell through and, and they wanted to do something from the use matrix that fit, fit in the footprint. Um, Just like William Taylor, anything in the use matrix is fair game. Yes. Yeah. Now, I will say on that, they didn't, they didn't have a use matrix. <laughs> when they first, when that first went through, mm -hmm. it was just that was commercial. Just if it met the definition yeah. of commercial, but yeah. here we have the whole, if Yeah, it, here at least we have a use matrix. Yeah. There at least someone could look through and see what could happen <clears throat> or what would be uh, permitted, uh, not allowed. And, and it is possible that the the applicant could decide that they've done as much as they want. They can't do any more. They want to sell it to someone else. They then are held to the PUD document, but it doesn't mean we get any more affordable housing out of the deal if they've already met the goals. Correct. If they've met, you know, the proffer. Now, the the one catch to that is if they wanted to do residential, they have to keep that percentage. They have to keep that percentage. Um, the same, but if they did commercial, there's yes. okay. And. I'm stepping out a little bit on a limb, but I'll just ask you to tell me if I don't know them. But the, there's some amount of potential or already have transacted funding related to Charlottesville Housing Fund to help with land acquisition on this property? For Carlton View 2, yes. City Council, um, there was a uh, $1.44 million for land acquisition for Phase 2, which is <coughs> the far western section to build Carlton View Two, and so the 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 applicant again the applicant can speak more to this, but they've gone through this process now twice, and they feel very confident they know how to do it to go through the third time for Carlton View Three to to uh, line up their funding for that affordable building. And without getting into the weeds of that um, grant, I guess were there strings attached to the funding mechanism to provide for affordable housing on that phase? I will ask the Stacy to come back up to answer that. So for the, the phase that we funded this fiscal year, um, that's in the process of going through the planning phases, um, it, it, the, the funding was contingent upon the fact that all units in that building would be affordable. Okay. So that will put them at um, once that is complete, I think they'll be at 66% affordable units for the entire 154. Um, and they have con reached out to me recently and um, are looking to apply for uh, or request another 1.44 million for that third building. So again, those would be affordable units in there if we can get the funding. And, and are, is that document part of the PUD document then too? so that future planning commissions or councils can go back and see both of them no, together? That, no, that wouldn't be attached because right now they don't have the, the zoning or the density to allow for that. So they're having preliminary conversations with Stacy um, with the knowledge that they have to see the outcome of this as to whether it could be done at all. So the first two residential buildings were um, financed with low-income housing tax credits, which are received through Virginia Housing Development Authority, um, and they have already 
uh, signed agreements that those units will be affordable for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe, and I, I'm not entirely clear on this, um, that if they were to sell those properties, they would still need to remain affordable, I think, through the end of that term. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to be sure that in the future, so if they're negotiating this, mm -hmm. once they complete negotiations and they were to get the funds from the housing authority or the housing fund, right. would that then become part of the PUD application? Or PUD document, I should say. No, because no. you the, the PUD would have to be in place first for them to receive any funding because right now they can't do any more density on the site. Right, so right. That's, I guess I'm saying yeah. if we approve this as a PUD mm -hmm. and everything was went through and they were still negotiating that, would that document from Stacy then become part of no. this package? No. Yeah. So any future housing fund dollars that we would um, provide through a grant would be contingent upon them receiving additional low-income housing tax credits. Mm. Okay. Um, and the, the, the grants that come from the housing fund are subject to written grant agreements. So they okay. themselves have conditions and performance measures built into them. Okay. Are you already hear the applicant? Uh, I have one more question okay. for Matt. Matt, so we have uh, four parcels. Two of them um, represents about two thirds of the area of the site um, already built on or planned out to be built on, and the, the plans are decided upon. We are left with a third of the site that is disjointed. Um, are there any other mechanisms to get? planning zoning mechanisms to get the density they want for those remaining parcels other than rezoning the entire site after two-thirds of it's already been developed? Unless legal wants to step in, uh, we couldn't think of any there. You, you can't really, I believe, on purpose make something nonconforming. So the rezoning would have to affect all these parcels uh, because any drop in you know, any drop in that um, calculation, you suddenly are way above 21, which is which is the max. There's not even a, a another SUP above that. That's the max density for MI. Um, R3 was looked at, but it looked like the pace center probably would then be non-conforming if you went to R3. Um, so there, it's. But you see, my point is that we're not getting the real benefit of a PUD when two-thirds of the site's already been decided upon. And the third that's left is at the opposite ends of the site. And I, and I think that's a, a valid thing to have a discussion. I do think the flip side of that, though, is to the, the applicant kind of backed into a PUD. Even though they didn't request it at first, they started developing this kind of together with the pay center and the housing. Um, so I, I, I see where you're coming from, and I do think that's, that's valid, but I also do think there is, uh, just because it's not PUD now, and they're looking at it, that it, the components were there. Thank you. Well, maybe this is a question for the applicant or perhaps for Stacy. I'm, I'm still sort of hung up on the universal design and accessibility features. Do you know what it would add to the cost of this to just make all of the units accessible from the get-go? I don't know if Stacy knows that. The applicant might have better <laughs> understanding since they're, they've done development on that, um, but I do okay. not. I mean, we, uh, we see situation. Well, I'll wait for discussion. But. I also think some of the elevation concerns with the site lead into that, but we'll let the applicant okay, spend thank some you. time on that. <coughs> okay. At this time, we'll ask the applicant make a presentation and you have 10 minutes Great. thank you uh, madam commissioner members of the planning commission appreciate it uh, my name is Scott Collins I'm representing the applicants on this project and uh, thank you very much and you know as far as uh, staff report and everything uh, Matt did an incredible job on this he's been great to work with on this project and very very helpful and the staff report was awesome so really I'm just going to hit a couple highlights and talk about this a little bit and I'm um, really just here to answer some additional questions from that you guys might have um, you know going talking about a PUD you know I'm just glad that Mr. Santowski is here because a lot of this, a lot of the aspects of this is put in place 
with you in mind, knowing what kind of <laughs> items you'd be asking for. So I'm very happy that it, you actually are here for this because I'd feel kind of slighted if I brought this <laughs> next month and you weren't here. But. Well, well, don't stop doing it when he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. No. But to get back to, you know, PD, I think this is kind of like, you know, so many times I, I know PD's coming from y'all and everybody's kind of concerned about what they're actually going to get. This is kind of the reverse. You, we're actually building on a, a very, very successful project. And it looks great and it's been uh, wide received in the community. And it's really <coughs> providing something to the community that Charlottesville doesn't have. And that's what this project is providing. It's providing sort of this campus style um, campus style uh, um, development that provides accessible and affordable housing um, next to an amenity that's set up to provide um, amenities for for these for for them for the residents within walkable area and so much of it is accessible. Yes, there, there are elevators in all of the units. As far as accessibility, there's walkable, there's everything uh, between all the buildings. We're making sure we have accessible routes. That's all important because that's it's kind of creating this campus style um, overall development. And maybe that wasn't the original <coughs> intent or thought of back you know five years ago when we first did the Pace Center, but because of the success of the Pace Center and because of the success of the, these first couple um, apartment buildings, it's really kind of kind of metamorphed into this really cool development and we're just trying to continue that success and add to that <coughs> by adding on to this last building um, and I think there's some great discussions about the height of that last building um, it really the, the whole idea is that it's going to be about the same height as the current um, Carlton Views building you see it's really just because of that the change in the ordinance that's why we changed that but really that that um, streetscape is very true as far as what that height is going to be. It's just setting down lower. By the time you put the four-story building up there, um, you're going to have about the same height as the current Carlton views. You know, as far as architectural aspects of, there was no architectural aspects um, on this project at, at all. So the Pace Center was built <coughs> to very high standards. There was nobody out there saying they had to use those materials or had to be that type of style. It was built that way because the developers wanted to put together a quality building, quality development. Same thing with Carlton Views, no architectural reviews associated with that project. But yet they built a quality building. They're going to continue that on because they're not going to want to put something that's inferior next to all these awesome buildings they've already created out there. So I think that's really a lot of where you're the unknown of a PUD, I get that, you know, they're not spelled down there, but they already ha you have what you, the, what's already out there really gives you an example of what their commitment is, and that's, that is special, and I think that goes a long way. Um, I think that's been, that shows a, a huge success of how this project's gone. Um, let's see, a couple other things, the open space. Um, you know, there is more open space other than just the building and the parking footprint and everything. We have really tried to make sure we had 15% open space of what really counts as open space, space for the PUD. And that's really like the plazas, the courtyards, the uh, little pocket parks, and the little passive uh, recreational areas. Things that actually provide some type of you know, uh, amenity or some type of feature of open space, not just there's a patch of grass in between an island of parking. Does that count open space? We'll certainly have some of that too, but we really made sure that we had 15% of usable uh, open space that's um, of quality to the development as well. A um, couple other things. Let's see. Oh, bedrooms. You know, a lot of this, a lot of these units are really kind of geared toward um, you know accessible units for the elderly, and so you're not going to have you know three and four bedrooms, you know, that you're going to see somewhere more of a PUD, of an apartment building downtown to where, you know, that seemed to be a trend right now. That's just not the case. Um, it's really more your one and two bedrooms. It, you just don't, none of these buildings are really set up to have three and four <coughs> bedrooms and you're not going to see it. You're not going to have it. Um, it wasn't part of our, um, of our overall proffers, but we can certainly, you know, I'll talk to staff about what we can do between now and um, city council if there's any way to make that change but I mean it's just not what's the plan is for this overall development 
Um, it's not what the target market is. The market is not leading toward um, three bedrooms for elderly. They, it's really just one and two bedrooms. That's really what you, what you have. Um, <coughs> those are my main thoughts and considerations. I'm really here to, ask, to answer any other questions. I think there's a lot of good dialogue about the uses and um, you know, I think that really kind of kind of spells out, and I think the dialogue was good um, about being specific to what we profited. We tried to take out uses of the matrix that didn't really make sense, that wouldn't really fit in with, with the um, overall development and what's there and what in, in the surrounding neighborhoods. So we didn't, we didn't want to see like a gas station, um, even though you could do it under MI. We took that out, and we just tried to make um, decisions on what was the what was what would be consistent with the neighborhood and with the development and with uh, what's there on the site. Any questions for Mr. Mr. Collins? I don't really have a question, but I wanted to thank Scott for his kind words. But <laughs> and, and I will say that you know I've, I've had a chance to go through the Carlton Views apartments. It's a, it's a nice apartment building. The Pace Center does some really neat things. And this probably is one of the more probably is the most detailed PUD that we've seen or I've seen come through in terms of what we have here and all so I don't want, I don't want to be uh, be critical because I think we need more affordable housing we need more housing for the elderly and the disabled you know all of that's very important I guess it's those other nagging questions that come up as to what happens in those future pieces and I think that's what everybody else is kind of poking around at Sorry. but I think basically you know you've done a good job with this and you've been answering a lot of the questions and I think uh, Matt has as well so Definitely. a lot of good work has gone into it so yeah. I'll let somebody else ask what I want to remind us is we only have counsel until 730 so I want to make sure we get our questions answered so that we can have our public hearing and then let them stick around and have fun with this or whatever they go to the concert or whatever they need to do <laughs> so uh, any more any questions for Mr. well I, I wonder if you could just address a little more about uh, making all or most of the units accessible given the location the profile uh, we've seen other instances you know where people need to move apartments and and so I at one point I think we had a policy of really trying to encourage this it's kind of gone to the side and and given aging population and recent events I, I just would really like to explore that definitely and I think um, you can probably see some of it from the Carlton views building but you know all the units themselves are accessible you can get to them what via an elevator or from outside with ramps and everything else like that those are all accessible so then it becomes out com comes down to the actual build out of the units um, from my understanding pretty much most of the units, or if not all of the units, are set up to where they can be ultimately um, accessible units as the market, as the, as the, um, as the need is the, arise. So that, therefore, you, know, they, you can do, come in and do a couple of modifications, you know, the countertops to you know, some bathrooms and what have you, as long as the overall build of the unit is correct, which it is, you know, as far as turning radius. <coughs> so that's really the whole, the whole the whole key is the sort of the they have the ability to to provide those units at, upon demand. So, can you address what the additional cost would be to just have everything accessible within within a unit, particularly things like the zero grade showers, grab bars, elongated toilets, whatever is current in in that world? I'm a little out of date in it, but those things seem like they would be great to have from the beginning and then there wouldn't be a time lag if one tenant moved out another needed to move in you wouldn't be holding up on that so I, I just I'm curious as to what those costs would be right I don't know what the costs are right away but the type of funding they're going for um, with the VHDA um, a lot of all that's kind of spelled out with their guidelines and with their criteria is about how the units are rented out and how they're built so a lot of that is kind of kind of um, I guess resolved as they are working with the different um, lenders mainly BHDA because that's the type of funding they're going after for all these buildings which you know like they talked about you know they're close to getting the funding for Carlton views too and then for the second for the third building 
or I guess the last building on the project, they're working on the same type of funding. So I know that's, I don't have the figures of what it costs to answer your exact question, but um, certainly maybe we can look into that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, two moderately quick questions. <laughs> I'm, con I'm still confused about the open space thing. I don't, you don't have a plan in front of you, but maybe you I can did. get one. So that existing Carlton 154 unit apartment building completed 2017 has a plaza area to the page north that says 0.19 acres. Kind of map there. That's right. And I, I scaled it. It looks like it's 40 by 60, maybe 40 by 70. But... Point one nine acres is like eight thousand some odd square feet, but forty by sixty is like twenty four hundred. So I'm confused about where the other plaza area acreage comes from. And it looks like that point one nine acres and the point five by the street or point oh five gets me to the quarter acre open space for that building. One building has none and so I'm curious to know how the open space is calculated. So I tried to show the open space that counts sort of in the, in the green in that area. So it's the green areas sort of around the building, sort of the different little pocket park areas, the plaza, even like the, sort of the benches, the entrance at the entrance and everything. Okay. Landscape buffer back there, back next to the tracks and stuff. That doesn't count. That's not part of that. Oh. That's um, the buffer, the landscape buffer is an addition to that 15% uh, open space, and so is um, that tree preservation area <coughs> along uh, Franklin Street that's being preserved. That's okay. above and beyond. Okay. Okay, and then the, I didn't count them, but the text mentions 161 spaces, which I think includes 30 on the street. Am I doing that right? That's about it. And I don't know if the plan shows 130 on the property and 30 in the street, but I assume it probably does roughly, you know, within a few. Does that number in account for the 35% reduction already? Or d does, so, so your effective parking load is 35% more than the 160, so you could essentially park enough use to be somewhere over 200 cars required? So basically what we're doing, that 35% more or less applies for the residential aspect. The Pace Center was kind of treated by itself because they do have so many people coming first thing in the morning. We kind of took that part out of it. So it's really just sort of a 35% reduction on the residential aspect of the property. But knowing that there is open, there is parking on Carlton Avenue and Certainly, you know, it, in the evenings, you know, when people might have be having guests, there is still that ability, you know, to park in the parking lot that's over that pay center. But um, it does not include sort of any um, reduction if any of the commercial, um, if any commercial was included within these other parcels, they would have to be parked at current s standards because I think that's important. And I was just try I was having trouble thinking through on a site plan that looks constrained as it relates to open space. I mean, you kind of tucked it in where you could get it, but there's a preponderance of parking. I was trying to understand how the pace center parking load would come out of that 160, and then the one or two bedrooms require one car apiece. So, are we looking at a plan that's over parked for residential? I guess is the question, or would you say it's one per unit at 152 well it's one per unit at 152 then you take 35 percent of that so it's more like um 100 what 120 ish for the 152 spaces or 115 thereabouts and the pay center requires what's its parking this is where i'm trying to get there's 161 <laughs> physical parking spaces there for the pay center. that's their own and they use that if you go by it during the daytime um a lot of that parking is used up for the pace center so really that pace that that 61 spaces you see for the pace center itself is pretty is it's pretty true to what they need and what they require especially with all the um all the staff i mean staff shows up at seven thirty, eight o'clock and you know 25 of those parking spaces are pretty much taken up so i'm taking it that you'd say that the the plan as shown doesn't have it's not over parked for the residential it's 
pretty close within five or ten percent of what's required even <coughs> after the reduction in everything. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. Can I ask a quick question? Would parking be, Mr. Affley, parking be part of the site plan? Or do we need is this something we need to cover with PUD? I'm just trying to look at time. The reduction is something to okay. think about the PUD, but uh, do remember Proffer 4 talks about they cannot park over the requirement. Okay. Okay. So we could essentially come down and parking for at the site plan level with that Proffer? With, with their development plan for the 35% okay. residential. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Uh, Carlton 2, the conceptual layout, appears to cut off um, a, a corner of the site and potentially could turn its back on the rest of it. Is that deliberate to, to provide the opportunity to have a separate use if that was desired? Uh, Carlton 2, uh, not really, no. Because it has its own parking area separate from all the other parking areas with its own entrance. That area has significant grade. Yeah considerations uh, I know that that was uh, quite the engineering feat to get a building together that would um, that would meet the multiple needs over there so uh, I know that has part to do with that okay thank you and we did have several conversations about that when the Blue Ridge Pace Center came forward and the Carlton one when that whole thing was being looked at originally it, it was a, a lot of discussion about that Ms. Keller if you remember mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions for the applicant? You addressed my height, so I appreciate that. <coughs> Thanks for being patient with us as we have a little hesitation for planned unit developments. Absolutely. So, I'm around to answer any questions that come up. Okay. Thank you. I do want to open up for public hearing, and if we do have some questions, we'll come back to that since we are pressed for time. Mm -hmm. A little bit outside of that. Uh, Oh, <laughs> Norm. So, in about 30 seconds, hopefully, I'm going to open this up for public hearing when our counselor comes back. Oh. Okay. So, at this time, I want to open this up for the public hearing. <coughs> and at this time, I have um, two people signed up. Uh, but if anyone would like to speak after these two people, please come forward. You have three minutes. Please state your name and speak into the microphone so we can hear you. Uh, Mark Cavett. First, let me say that I'm very, uh, very much in favor of seeing more affordable housing done if it really is affordable housing. Uh, until last week, I was employed at Pace, so I know the area and the p property extremely well. I've been following this matter for quite some time. I had been told really not to discuss much and keep my mouth shut, but now I don't have to worry about that. Uh, Pace is currently, my main concerns is parking, the sight line from the street with cars going back and forth, as well as entering and exiting uh, the uh, street. Uh, the parking area by PACE, that entire lot is used 100% by PACE. PACE is also now using the street parking in addition in front of the building and a little bit up the hill. So I saw a plan some time back, uh, initial plan on the parking area, and it made it look like that it was over where the uh, uh, trash uh, dumpsters are. And that's totally not true. They're using that entire space and they're still growing. They're going to be using, needing more space and more street space. And there's about 25 junk truck buses that come in in the mornings, about 25 that go out at night. And so you have these vehicles coming in and out, bringing, bringing the people in. Uh, site aspect. i uh, experienced this personally myself many, many times. I almost had a few accidents where when you got cars parked on the street, you're not able to see with the, uh, the sight distance with those car cars parked because you got a hill coming down one way and a hill coming down the other way. So it makes it really difficult at times when you have those cars parked there to see further up enough to get by. You also have Carter Bridge uh, a few blocks away 
and they have big trucks and sometimes it's difficult to see those vehicles. Uh, again, uh, I wanted to say that, you know, if it's truly a, uh, for affordable housing and affordable housing from what I found out from talking to some of the people that are living in uh, Carlton One, they're paying anywhere from 800 to $1,200 a month. A lot of the people that are at Pace cannot afford that. Uh, we actually do have four spaces that are subsidized by Pace. Uh, we have people that come all the way from Livingston, uh, Lake Monticello, uh, Buckingham, uh, travel an hour's distance because they cannot find anything affordable in town. We really could use something that was designed for seniors. Most of the people that are living in Carlton uh, One uh, are working. A uh, few of them are disabled. Uh, I know of only three people that actually need a disabled uh, bathtub and kitchen. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, some of them, uh, from what I can see, most of them do appear to be working. Uh, I question how, m if we're not sometimes subsidizing people that have these affordable houses and live there. Uh, I heard about the quality of the building. Uh, Pace had a tremendous amount of problems with the building when it first opened up that had to be corrected. So I do hope the quality will really be a quality building that's done. I would question whether or not Carlton 4 would ever be done or it's just to make the number of units that they have be able to be more uh, market rate versus uh, really affordability. Uh, I could probably stay here for a long time talking about some of this and some of the things I've seen, uh, but don't have time for everything. Uh, but just be careful that you don't have the snow being, I mean, the wool being pulled over your eyes. I think there needs to be a little bit more research done on this project. I think there needs to be some more detail in the plans as well as what I've heard tonight that is some of the concerns that have been brought up tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bill Emery. Bill Emery, 1604 East Market Street. This development as initially designed, spread out across the 4.8 acres at 21 DUA, uh, which allowed for focusing on the well-being of the residents vis-a-vis -vis recreation and open space. Pumping up the density will come at the residents' expense. <clears throat> the PC understands, but the general public might not understand that there no is no different zoning for rich and poor. There is no special hogwaller lens that changes the scope of review in this matter. The, this is good enough for where it's going. This is good enough for who it's for. I have faith that the 10 PUD objectives and the zoning map amendment requirements will be evaluated here as exactly as you would evaluate them if this rezoning was in a higher income portion of the city. The meaning of not complying with the land use map is as significant here as it would be on Derry Road. I wish you all had been given the opportunity for work session as you often do with PUD applicants. There are questions and concerns that could have been addressed with a developer in such a format. These include the, formal SU, the former SUP conditions regarding maximum number of bedrooms and the 50-foot height limit, which haven't been carried forward, the lack of innovative arrangement of buildings and open space, the lack of higher quality, which is possible through PUD zoning. Is this a cohesive, unified project? You know, what percentage of the current residents are working for PACE or are PACE clients? That's, oh, excuse me. Will the pedestrian linkage between Building A, uh, Carlton Views 2, and the PACE Center actually come to pass uh, instead of having to walk out in the street and take the, or take the jump bus? Uh, can it be required? Where is the Carlton Views 2 open space, Parcel A? Generally, the quality of the open space is minimal. It's not usable for recreation. Much of it is not accessible to the elderly. Where's the variety of housing types? Where's the mix of incomes? What employment or stores ex exists near this proposed residential density? Why would we locate economically vulnerable people in an area with no services within walking distance? <coughs> West Haven is walkable. South First Street is walkable. This neighborhood is not. What has improved? by changing from M1 with an SUP to a PUD. What does it improve by changing? Yeah. Uh, staff finds the only substantial and realistic change the 
change that resenting to PUD will achieve is an increase in residential density. The code, the PUD objectives should lead to quality, like uh, Timberlake Place, rather than quantity. People, warehouses <coughs> floating on asphalt mm -hmm. like this. The PUD ordinance allows a developer to, a developer to build a neighborhood. This doesn't make the cut. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else that'd like to speak to this. <laughs> Let's please state your name. Uh, good evening. My name is Nancy Carpenter, uh, resident of the city. Um, I recently started following this request, um, went down to physically look at the uh, location. Uh, historically, when uh, the Pace Center came uh, Ford uh, to be decided on and built, and it's a lovely facility. It, it addresses a lot of things. I remember there was a lot of conversation that the great thing about the apartments was that it would have people working there uh, uh, and could live there, as well as some of the elderly. It doesn't seem like that has happened. I mean, it is. We do need low-income housing. I do have a lot of calls uh, for people who are interested in getting assistance in order, you know, to move into the existing apartment building. Um, but I do look at the open space, and I don't think a bicycle rack green space should count as open space. I really don't see a place where someone can take their shoes off and feel the, the ground and really you know, get that environmental component of what a green space is. I mean, if you didn't know that it was an apartment building, you really wouldn't have any idea that real people live there. Okay, there's no uh, exterior uh, uh, structures that seem to indicate that come out, this is green space, have a sit, take your blanket out, come out with your children if it's a two bedroom and you have a child. Um, I do think there, by the way, I do think there is a need for three bedroom apartments in this community for sure. And, uh, but there was also another thing that I noticed, it is a desert, it's a food desert, it's a service desert. Um, it's an area that uh, the comprehensive plan model draft map calls for some uh, <coughs> density down there, but there's no attendant density for services, meaning um, you don't want to have car-centric. I hear a lot of you on this planning commission talk about car-centric developments and trying to decrease the um, uh, reliance on you know personal automobiles. Well, this is an area where you want to bring in more people, like Mr. Kravitz was talking about, with employees, and more needs for food, for dry cleaning, for pharmacy, for uh, hardware store, because you might want to stop and get, you know, you have a project you're doing at home when you have to drive to Buckingham, or you're driving to Fluvanna, or wherever you happen to live, and you might want to stop at a hardware store to pick up some nails, some glue, some something, you know. So there's a need for those types of services in that community, as well as I think that CAT right now is looking at um, changing some of the routes that serve some of these uh, parts of the city and decreasing the number of, of stops. And we want to talk about putting a bus shelter in. Well, it, yeah, absolutely there should be a bus shelter, and absolutely there should be a wealth of bus stops. You shouldn't have to work, walk a half a mile or a mile to get to a bus stop, which is another component of this PUD. I mean, you're talking about an impact of life. You should look at all the impacts of life. And that's another thing that I think the uh, uh, Planning Commission needs is a tool from the Human Rights Commission, their housing subcommittee, on a strong impact tool to take a lot of this in, into play. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I'm Rachel Bigger. Can you hear me if I speak like this? Actually, we need you to speak in the microphone so we record. I get very nervous from the microphone. I'm sorry. Can you hear me if I speak right like this? Can you? I can. Okay. All right. Um, I live at Carlton Views Apartments. My name is Rachel. And um, I would say that some of the things stated here do not accurately reflect the general um, experience of the people living there. I've spoken with all of my neighbors every opportunity I could for the last three months. I would say, um, in general, they're not considered desirable apartments. People consider them to be too expensive. Many of, of the folks there do live with some a Section 8 or some um, other support for the cost, but many people are paying full price. I pay together with a required payment of $30 a month for a rented washing machine, um, $880 a month for one apartment, um, for one room apartment. And that was after qualifying f for this place, which is more than 50% of the, what the income I've had when I came in. Um, 
So there's general frustration with um, the apartment. People experience it as having been hastily built and not built right, and things such as um, broken dishwashers, the sliding doors for balconies being too heavy to move, doors closing on people as they enter and exit their apartments, um, management um, not answering for repair service calls, management not being on property ever, and people being told many times, please go over to Greenstone um, to talk to a manager, but that there is literally no person in the apartment most of the time. Um, Let's see. I think that the quality of the apartment building was kind of misrepresented. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm, but I, I'm not um, believing on that. There's been frustration that the elevator has broken. When the power's out, there's not a backup generator, and there are people on the second, third, fourth stories who are disabled and really need to have backup um, support for the elevator. Um, very few people are actually using PACE who live in the Carlton Views, even who are um, qualified for it. People are, mm, it may well be just something that someone could walk them over and make them introduce, but there's actually some interest for certain families. Um, I, I took a bunch of notes that are not in order, um, but The issue with affordable really is difference between low income versus affordable is, is serious. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a perception that people were moved from another low income affordable place to this apartment to fill it quickly so that it could be said that it was full. That is a really common perception over there that I heard from many different people. Um, so, just saying, there's a really serious problem about the green space, which is the perception is that there's dog poop on it and there's not a place for people to walk dogs that's specified for that. So the green space that's between the road and the building is a place to jump over, otherwise you'll step in dog poop, is just a general um, perception. And likewise on the green grass in front of the building. Um, there's no smoking area that is actually within the code for what the requirements are according to the leases. The leases say we must be 45 feet away from the building, but actually the smokers are right by the building. And the people who live on that first floor, many of them are oxygen and complaining that there are people smoking right outside their window and they can't go in or out. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, there's a mop um, cleaning process that happens that puts fumes in the whole building and there's very poor ventilation and some of them were um, oxygen deprived persons who use oxygen support. Um, do not go in and out on Saturdays or on Tuesdays. <sighs> parking is already tight. The parking sizes are not standard. The parking um, spaces are very cramped and people are very concerned that they will hit each other's cars. Also, many, many of the places are labeled compact car. A normal size car, even a compact car, my car is very small, it's a, a Breeze, it's an old Plymouth Breeze, it's a very small car. Even parked side by side, if I'm in any of the spaces, much less the ones labeled uh, compact, you can't open the door and get in and out. And I don't have a disability, I'm able to squeeze and bend, but not everybody can. Um, the balcony doors, I said, are too heavy to slide on many of the places they're not put on right, and the answers haven't been um, called. I'm sorry, I'm probably going over your time. Um, there has been a, a, a cry out from the people who live there to me for a playground within walking distance. There's a trailer park neighborhood across with lots of kids. There are many people would like to have families in the Carlton Views apartments, but the perception is it's not a place to have kids because there's no place for them to play at all. They could walk down to Reeves Park, they could walk down to the park that's on Chesapeake on Mead Street, um, Mead, uh, Carlton down the road, um, but there's not a place where a parent can watch their kids play um, and that would be highly, highly desirable. Um, You've got a couple more minutes. Thank you very so. much. You see, I, I wrote everything in, out of order. Um, the fridge is right against the wall in my apartment and most of them and it doesn't open all the way. It just wasn't planned to be used is the experience that some of us have had. Um, uh, 
the sidewalk ends right in front of Pace, and so many times people are walking across diagonally across the road, um, jaywalking, or whatever you call that, um, on the Carlton Avenue hill, and it's a very dangerous place, and there are people coming down the hill quickly. I am concerned someone will get hurt. It actually is a good distance to bicycle to um, downtown Charlottesville for those of us who are able to do things like that. Um, I, I love the location. I'm not convinced that this project is for the people, though. Um, and I, I did attend the um, Affordable Housing Summit part of the um, the Tom Tom Festival, and it was emphasized by many different groups that there would be a, a desire to include more input from people who live in these neighborhoods. Um, I would love to see more housing in Charlottesville that is affordable. Um, I can't afford my apartment, and I will be moving out soon, probably. Um, but, and, and um, uh, yeah, I appreciate all you um, probably letting me talk this long. This okay. does make me nervous, but I, I, I had a bunch of things. Thank you. Here. I'm going to see if somebody else can, see if you can give final, final thoughts. Would there be a possibility for smoker areas that are covered so that if it's rainy or hot for smokers not to be right the door, by the door? I mean, I know these are more detailed things, but I have heard from many people that they were told to go to Greenstone to, to tell complaints that there's not a person in the office usually, almost ever. And um, until I see some kind of responsible management of the place that's there, of the people who do live there now, I just don't, I don't believe that additional spaces for, for houses should be approved until um, the reality of the people who live there is assessed. And, and problems addressed. Thank you so mu much. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this project? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. And if there are any questions y'all have now, we can go back to that or we can open up discussion. Well, I think that, that was a very in informative set of comments and I wondered if any of them uh, would be covered under the SUP requirements. I, I, I didn't pick any out immediately. Oh, and I didn't understand, what was this about commercial approval? Was that different from what's already in the plan? Um, well, I think that um, I'm going to ask you to direct staff, to uh, talk with staff about that. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I want to, that's okay. Um, uh, we, we can go over that a little bit in our comments and maybe that will answer some of your questions. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to de derail us and I know that many of these were about the interior layouts and they'd be beyond yeah. our purview, but some of them did perhaps fall into the site plan and, and I just wondered if, um, uh, since this resident did take the time to come here and explicitly state some of those, if there could be some follow-up. I know we're not the council and we don't necessarily right. respond in the same way that they do, but if any of them could be addressed under the SUP or the site plan, I would think it would be a good thing to do. Well, you know, I, I was wondering, <clears throat> you know, the question about like playgrounds, because I think there's somewhere in the document that talks about families and children and things like mm -hmm. that. And Reeves Park is a, a bit of a distance away, especially if you have a family, if anybody has a disability, a mobility issue, or something else, because the bus, when it comes down Carlton, goes down Reeves Street. It doesn't come all the way down Carlton to uh, whatever that is down there, to Franklin. Is that it? Yeah, Franklin. So actually, the bus never comes past Carlton Views and the Pay Center and then swinging down onto Franklin to get you to Reeves. So somebody would have to walk mm -hmm. up to Carlton and Reeves to catch the bus rather than being able to catch it in front of them. And again, if you're talking about a, a community where, for one, you're looking at under parking it a bit, and then two, with a, a number of people with disabilities, um, that, that can be kind of worrisome that the bus does. Now, there may be discussions going on and all like that, but it seems to me that that would really, if, as this project grows, would really be two of the things. You'd want to have a playground on site. You want to have a place for children to play. And you want to have a bus stop right in front of it. Would the commission mind if I ask the applicant another question? No. 
Um, it's all this weekend. I, I said we can open back up. You got questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, would you be willing to answer? Yeah, I, I, I would object to a discussion or rebuttal, but I don't object to questions. Questions. Um, based, off, based off of the, the uh, information attached, uh, there are, and, and, and based off of the application plan, uh, it's a conceptual plan. And based off of what we've heard, we understand that there's apartments for Carlton too, ready to go. Your uh, matrix showed some commercial. It even showed a grocery store. It showed those different things. Can you give us a little more understanding about what you have planned for this Carlton three? Certainly. Um, Any ideas? Because it's just conceptual at this point. With it's the still matrix. conceptual. And they're still trying to um, obtain. Um, funds to go build the um, Carlton 3 through um, VHDA, and that's what we're working on right now this summer. They're trying to obtain those funds. There is talk about providing some type of maybe small commercial area within um, that building mm -hmm. that could offer those services. Um, but keep in mind, you know, as this project comes along, there's things are develop, developed and built out over time. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, piece of property that's in your comp that's in the comp plan that's in the even in the y'all's new comp plan the sessions is not even a quarter mile away it's the junkyard the junkyard is not going to stay there forever I mean that's going to be your next hub and that's not even what a quarter of a mile from this site um, there's there's although there's not services right now there will be absolutely I mean there's so much potential just in that one area um, alone that would Address most any any needs in the entire neighborhood. So, but right now, what you guys are looking at is something through VHDA, which would be more housing. Not that's necessarily. correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, if you and the owner uh, had this, you your firm and the owner had this entire site uh, blank and uh, approached it uh, as a blank slate uh, with a PUD in mind. Um, would it be di different? Be different. It, it's hard to say. I mean, as far as take this piece of property as it sits, as it sits now, I mean, it's a very challenging site mm -hmm. from from many aspects. Maybe mainly terrain, and what it backs up to is the railroad tracks and where it's located. There's a lot of things that go along with this site that make it very specific. Um, but the arrangement of the buildings. Um, the the accommodation of open space uh, where parking is okay you think that would be any different than if you had started over from scratch right now no i don't actually i think um you know what's unique about this project is that every single building every single uh, part building that's being built as far as the carlton views and the second one and even the third one there that's that's proposed is very site specific and site, site unique. You don't have a case of, of a apartment complex builder coming in and say, I got my prototypical building, I'm gonna put right here, I'm gonna make it work. I'm gonna take this site, I'm gonna grade it, I'm gonna fill it, I'm gonna do it. You know, the architects are actually looking at the, the site, studying it, figuring out how to make it work for these uses. So, no, I don't think so okay, in that thank aspect. You. It, it, there were there was a lot of conversation back when we were looking at this when the the Pace Center. Have you been able to assess and look at that? Because um, part of that conversation, and I remember this now, uh, was the accessibility on that sidewalk from the existing Blue Ridge Pace Center up to Carlton too. With this site and and the design, is that accessible for someone, say in a wheelchair, to be able to to get on that sidewalk and get to? Carlton too, because there was a lot of discussion about having to get on the jaunt bus and then get out on Carlton just to get up to the next building. Yeah, they made some changes. Um, you can you can kind of see it on this plan. Um, they've actually set it up to where they've taken out a small portion of that wall and they're going to have a lower level. The elevator goes all the way down to that level, so you can come out of that building on the back side and then come across. The, we're putting installing a um, ADA um, accessible okay. walk. Um, across the parking lot over to the Pace Center. So that will be all ADA accessible. Okay. 
So that, that is important, yes, and absolutely. Any other questions? Is it possible you guys could address some maintenance issues? It seems like a pretty long <laughs> Yeah, the, the best way to say it is that, you know, this is 54 units that's out there right now. Certainly, you know, as more units come online, you do have more staff that's devoted to um, on, being on site all the time. I mean, most apartment complexes, if it's anywhere below 100 units, you're, it's very typical to find your leasing offices and your staffing, everything else like is off site because they do it from another, from another place because it just takes so much. Um, so, I get it. I'm just asking. Yeah. So as far as the maintenance aspect, yeah, oh, I will you. definitely talk to the client afterwards, and okay. I think they can. You know, it's all from you know this building was only was just finished up, um, what okay. less than six months ago. So I'm certainly certainly working through some issues. I, okay. Absolutely. Already open up discussion or more questions? Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank All you. All right. So, discussion? Well, for all the specificity of this, there still are a good number of details and questions that that remain unanswered. I, I think uh, Mr. Emery enumerated a number in, in his correspondence with us um, that seemed to point to some uh, potential impacts of this. Uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly about the, the types of units, uh, numbers of bedrooms. Uh, I'd almost, given the conversation we've had tonight, I'd almost like to see a diagram of how people would circulate and use the site. There's a lot of language about it, but um, I mean, we've we've had some critiques of the of the open space and the parking and building arrangement. Uh, those are all the things that contribute to a successful PUD. Um, I, I think there's a, a lot of motivation to have a project like this. Uh, move forward, but I think the, the last speaker did s certainly bring the point home that we want these to be very, very good and livable and successful communities, and I think maybe a little more time to address some of these questions would result in a, in a better community and therefore a better PUD. I would echo those thoughts and, and, and the lack of services and the bus route and a lot of different things. Yeah, I mean, we can't, we can't force there to be right. services or for them to be successful, mm -hmm. but it would be good to know where, where they would be, what percentage could be uh, uh, devoted to those uses in the mm -hmm. future and reserved for those or built at the time when there's such a demand. Of the um, 10 standards of review for PUDs, uh, number two is to encourage innovative arrangements of buildings and open spaces to provide efficient, attractive, flexible, and environmentally sensitive design. Number four, to encourage the clustering of buildings for more efficient use of land and preservation of open space. Number five, to provide for developments designed to function as cohesive, unified projects. Number nine, to provide for coordinated linkages among internal buildings and uses and external connections at a scale appropriate to the development and adjacent neighborhoods. I look at the site plan and I see a scattering of, of four buildings um, that is surrounded by parking driveways and parking. Uh, the green space is the leftover places around the buildings um, with some little parket, pocket areas uh, uh, that are just leftover spaces that can't be used uh, for anything else. Um, it's a very disappointing example of a PUD to me. <clears throat> yeah. You know,
know, it's interesting, you know, because I know that there's a real lack of what we consider affordable housing. In a lot of ways, you know, the, uh, you know, the first apartment building that went up did help to meet a large need of that. And, you know, I think that the rest of it will probably help along those ways. But I, you know, I do have to agree that I think that there's just probably some unanswered questions as to additional green space and circulation. And it does bother me that we don't have nailed down yet that there's actually going to be a, a transit stop in front of the building. And maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I, I think maybe uh, the staff report kind of indicated that both Cat and Jaunt stopped there, but a Jaunt, of course, but I'm not sure about Cat. And just, you know, if we're encouraging a community, are we, let's not build another community in, in isolation, you know? Uh, and I think Scott's right. I mean, uh, we know just from our own comp plan use that we expect a lot of changes to be happening over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years in the city, but that doesn't solve what may or may not happen with this, this space there. Um, yeah, I would like to see more green space. I don't know if it's possible to reduce the size of some of these buildings to perhaps provide more of that. Um, you know, there's more height on it, but do they need to be quite as big? I guess it's, you know, when you go down to both corners, it looks like there's really not easily accessible green space that's in there. And, you know, if it is supposed to be, you know, multifamily and encouraging that, I, you know, I think it's going to be a, a difficult thing. Some of the property management issues, I mean, that's property management. I think we have to be careful to separate right. the two out. Um, so I'm, I'm still listening, see what everybody else has to say. As Mr. Lahindro was reading the um, standards for review on plan unit developments, I kept on waiting on for him to get to the one that says, and you know, providing a lot of affordable housing, but that's not one of the standards of review. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems to be the primary appeal of what we have before us. And, and what's built already meets the promise in the proffer. So while everybody's best intentions are to see more affordable housing, the proffer says 30% of 150, it's 45 units, and I think there are 50 there now. So it's just not one of the review criteria, and when we look at the criteria, the plan itself, because it has come at the end of a build-out generally, it, it can't achieve the provisions of the review given it's kind of backed itself into a corner and so while well, I appreciate Mr. Collins explanation that you know part of our trepidation on PUDs in the past is not knowing what we were going to see in this case we can see three quarters of it and um, I don't know that it rises to the level of what PUDs aspire to be for the city as a development tool that allows for more innovative work so that being said, I don't think all is lost given the um, the parcels that, you know, there are two very strategically unbuilt parcels still remaining on the land. And so I'm not exactly sure what the answer could be, but programmatic wise, it sounds like the desire is to deliver a product that is needed in the community. They've left the door open with, through their proffers with some amount of support services, uh, you know, kind of neighborhood services that could be present. And so it's a difficult site that requires a creative solution. And I, I think it could happen. I'd like to see more time spent trying to wrestle it down to be more definitive in how to address the unique character of the site. And, you know, I, I leave the door open to be able to understand more about what the limitations are without an exhaustive package of design documents which aren't required by the PUD submission process but could be helpful for us to understand the complications that are involved in you know it, we don't know anything other than the plan that we can see and so it's difficult to understand all the thought that's gone into arriving at where they were with the description so um, 
I'd like to see it again. I guess I I won't see it again. I'd like to <laughs> I'd like to watch it again from the sidelines. Yeah. But it, you know, I think it's a strategically important piece of land in the city that can provide for needs that our community has, and it can be done well. And I think with a little more time, it could probably be done well. You know, on uh, uh, with the with the bones of what we already have built as the basis of that that new idea. That's so. what I was. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh -huh. I keep looking at this, going, "Oh, but we talk about affordable housing and the need, and of all price points." Mm -hmm. And then I go back to the forty-seven hundred meetings we've had, where we talk about the complete picture, our mm -hmm. pinwheel, and and we're leaving a lot out. Yeah. And that's where. And then, kind of the reality of you crunching the numbers and I'm going to miss that of going well wait a second they're already there so they don't have to have any more affordable unit units in this so yeah that's the struggle I am having yeah I think we all acknowledge that that we need housing and that this is a place where that could happen and and I appreciate that applicants and staff work together to try to use the tools that we have in our existing land development regulations but it it constantly amazes me that we can have a PUD come and have the applicant and staff tell us that it meets these 10 objectives when they often don't you know because it, it isn't it isn't innovative maybe the idea is innovative but the arrangement is not innovative it's 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 not giving you the cluster the variety all of those kinds of features and and I think that um, Low, inco low income, frail elderly uh, populations deserve quality environments and we need to figure out a way to deliver those. And, and, and I think it's our responsibility as a community to help applicants realize that vision, not just in the minimum way, but in the best way possible. And if maybe that happened in the 1960s and the 1970s when affordable units were provided to our community maybe we wouldn't have some of the issues we have today if mm -hmm. if if that extra effort had gone into s some of them so i don't want us to stop this project i don't want us to deny it but i'd like to see it come back to us in a better form i do want to make sure that um that the the re that you all see that the report in front of you was a was a very fair um review of each mm -hmm. of those sections it did not um did not provide an uh, unfair analysis one way or the other. They, mm -hmm. The report uh, weighed the facts and provided you all with information in order to make a decision. Um, it did not say that all of those criteria were met. No, and nor does any PUD need to meet all of these objectives, but I think it needs to meet mm -hmm. A substantial number of them and I think this can with some more with some more work and and I think someone made the point of a work session and maybe a, a preliminary coming to us would have been helpful uh, or, or a work session would have been helpful and maybe tonight could serve that purpose as serving as a preliminary because there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of moving parts to this and um, I, I feel confident that that a better project that could meet our concerns could come back to us. I would like to, I did highlight several things from the staff report, not the applicants, because those are different. And it reminds me of the CIP criteria. When things come forth and we try to force the square peg in the round hole and make that project work for the CIP. But there are several things on the staff report that I highlighted saying, oh, you know, this doesn't necessarily meet that. Uh, so, uh, I agree with you. I did. I did see several of those. <coughs> Do we have a motion? I would like to understand the clock on this, if because I would be in favor of a deferral, but I don't know what that does to the project clock. Well, I don't know where we are within the yeah, I'm not sure where days. we are within those days either. I, I, I would assume we, we had one more potential meeting, um, but we'll see if we can confer. March 27th. Oh, we're good. 
if what does that mean we're, we're good we have to report <clears throat> back within um, 100 days okay. if we were to deny the PUD what happens you would recommend that and it would move to council mm -hmm. okay I think one of the reasons why a deferral might make more sense is mm -hmm. that um, the the some further explanation of what would occur in the two buildings as proposed could begin to address some of those concerns related to open space and or mm -hmm. um, innovation related to how the uses are configured you know we only have footprints and a potential not even a footprint we just have a potential building area that's kind of outside of where the parking is but more information related to at least the phase three build or phase four building Carlton three would I think have the potential to answer some of the questions for all we know there's rooftop gardens we don't know you know would that answer <laughs> all the questions that we've just talked about I mean the, uh, let me let me kind of weigh out the concerns I heard open space parking uh, services uh, building arrangement uh, type of units um, number of bedrooms so pedestrian connectivity. pedestrian connectivity um, and and the bus service mm -hmm. so transit so would and, and this is the question coming back just looking at the programming of the building or more detailed look of the building is that going to answer all those questions Hopefully, don't answer most of them. Right. I mean, it would it would it would provide more specificity if this project, for some reason, is delayed and not done now, and it needs to be picked up in the future. Uh, there wouldn't be those unanswered questions. Right. Yeah, I, I guess I'm looking at like you know three and four. You know that area that's that's down in that far corner, and I guess what we're hearing is we don't know what that will really be in the future. And so there could be a lot more green space or there could be better connectivity. We just don't know. All we have is the picture to go on as to what it's intended to be right now. And well, it basically they, they provided you all with a footprint. If you remember way right. back in the discussion, mm -hmm. um, they, they denoted the, the, mm -hmm. the potential right. envelope because they don't have those details yet. Right. No, no. But I guess what I'm saying is that looking at that, that could be anything. It could all mm -hmm. be built out just the way they're showing it here or it could be built out much differently I'm and I guess that's if I'm hearing you folks right down the other end there is you know what is the intent of that with some of the questions that you know Lisa's mm -hmm. brought up and and with all of that it's just hard to know because when we approve the PUD in essence we're saying we're, we're it's, you're rolling the dice with it hoping that it'll work out and I really do want to see you know the housing piece of it really work out but you're right you want to have services and amenities and you don't want to just be you don't want it to turn out that you're warehousing you know people with disabilities because the folks who are non-disabled are going to get out and do whatever they need to do but if you put the elderly and the disabled in there all of a sudden you're you know and you're running into problems with property management and all then all of a sudden it, it looks like crescent halls all over again you know maybe not today but maybe five years down the road or ten years down the road and and is that what we want to be known for? Exactly. And I, I started out with a with a question about how is this serving a vulnerable population? And one of the reasons to do this is that we have the PACE Center there uh, kind of as an anchor, you know, if it were mm -hmm. shopping center, it would be your anchor tenant, mm -hmm. right? And now we have more information, anecdotal, but I believe reliable from a resident and from a former employee on site that very few people are living and working there so that that uh, quality of the community that we sort of counted on when we considered the SUP seems not to have been realized so perhaps something that would address uh, what percentage or numbers of units would be devoted to the frail elderly and disabled populations might give us some sense of how this could become a community um, that would make 
use of, of the pace center being there. I mean, that, that, would be some, that would be something to me that would then put it more in the innovative category or uh, address some of the uh, 10 objectives of the, of the PUD. Mm -hmm. if, if, um, Mr. Chairman, could I ask Stacy if she could come back up? I had a question or two that maybe she could answer for us, or answer for me. Stacy, I'm just kind of curious, does the, the Housing Authority have any, has, have they looked at this and do they feel comfortable with this or did, did you look at it and as far as the, the use for elderly and disabled, do you guys have any say or control over what happens in here? No, so it would be difficult unless they classify the building as um, elderly disabled housing it would be difficult for them to um, prevent anybody else from moving in because that would violate fair housing right, laws sure. um, as far as I know the Housing Authority has not looked at it um, I don't know or the hack or anybody yeah no no um, the Housing Authority I do know there are some families that have, that have CRHA housing choice vouchers that have moved into those units um, that's as far as I know okay, okay. Was there a community meeting on this project? Mm -hmm. There was, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So I <laughs> am. <laughs> Am I hearing that someone wanted to ask for a deferral to possibly have the uh, concerns addressed that we listed and maybe the applicant got a list of those concerns or could get a list of those concerns at some point? Or I need a motion. Right. Well, I think collectively we have enough concerns that it's not really appropriate for us to vote to approve it this evening. I certainly don't want to vote to deny it, um, and so I'm not. I'm sort of between whether the applicant would want to offer a deferral or whether we should vote on a deferral. Well, would we if we and, voted? And, I, and because it is this yeah. profile of project, I don't understand whatever concerns there might be in terms of financing and that sort of thing that would be time sensitive and in that sometimes it makes sense to to vote a project up or down and send it to council because of the clock right. um, but if we don't have that situation I would prefer a deferral as a practical matter and I'm sure you all are weighing this as well um, at your next meeting if there is full attendance, there will be four different people here who aren't here tonight. That's right. <laughs> and so um, taking into consideration that um, unless the, um, the applicant, um, you know, would consider it um, beneficial to, to make some changes to the proposed application, um, that that can't be required of them uh, it it's going to be difficult for them to be able to come back here and simply have a follow-up mm. presentation because that there are going to be four people here who weren't here for this discussion so just because we defer doesn't mean they would have to address any of our concerns that's correct mm -hmm. so they, they could bring back the same they could if they choose to but if if that's not desirable for them financially um, or if the 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 concerns that you've expressed would would have a substantial impact on their pro formas or whatever. Um, it, it could be it could come back for another hearing with um, the same presentation uh, and um, a possible whole different set of concerns from people <laughs> who weren't here tonight. You might consider asking the applicant if they have uh, something briefly to add. Would you like mm -hmm. to add something? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we were hoping. Thank you very much. No, I appreciate this. And um, 
No, certainly up until this afternoon, I, don't, I think a deferral was actually even out of, out of the picture because of the type of funding they're trying to get. They have to qualify with that shows that they actually have a zoning in order to apply for it, uh, the type for this year, this current year. Um, it makes it really, really complex. But I, I know it's a, centers a lot of like, especially everybody's talking about, you know, Carlton Three, open space, and what have you. There's a couple of things that I'm not sure if you. If you picked up in the PD, I just want to point out real quick. One, keep in mind there is a note on this application plan that there's a minimum of additional 0.25 acres of green space to be incorporated into the Carlton Three. Now that could definitely be go into from what we heard tonight, you know, playgrounds and that what have you. Another thing we've also noted in the PUD because we're as they're working on the design of this building, there's probably going to be some tuck under parking. There's probably going to be some parking underneath that building footprint, and the PUD allows for that. So it's something that we didn't want to come out of the box and commit to because it's still working through all the things, but there's going to be some parking underneath that building in order to make it all work, um, which means that there's some areas also above that was in that building uh, in that parking footprint that can be used for some additional green space to help provide some of those green space areas that we're hearing tonight that there's the desire for, that are need for, um, that makes a lot of sense to go ahead and incorporate that. There's things in there. The problem is when you, when you look at the PUD application of the requirements, um, you try to put it together to where the project can kind of evolve and meet the needs, but if you do it so specific, an application plan that's very down to the very inch part of the building, we have we have to come back to to you guys in six months saying oh the building shifted four feet so we try to create envelopes and try to create the ability to incorporate green space incorporate what the market wants um, as far as the need for a playground and all that stuff that's there it's in the code right now um, it's just the ability you got to go ahead and do it um, and I understand from Planning Commission absolutely the assurance that it's going to be there. And, you know, I keep in mind, I guess we heard from one resident tonight that um, certainly there were some things that could be done better, but we haven't heard from the 53 other people. That's because there are, so. where, I, I really apologize for shouting, but I came to speak because several people asked me to come. Okay. I, I, I don't know if that's all right, accurate so or not. Let me, let me just start. Right. What, what we were, so you came up, and I, what we needed to hear from you is, is you are or what not willing to defer you're not going to ask for deferral you're saying you can't defer i'm giving you additional information because i think what right. you guys want is there and if i defer and come back to you i guess i get really confused because in one part i mean I'm, i come i've come from the planning commission so many times with with applications and we have these discussions we're like no we don't want to design your project for you we're either going to deny it or we're going to move forward a matter of you know having the assurance you, making sure you guys have the assurance that it's going to be there. But then all of a sudden, if something changes, then we have to come back. But, you know, I, I guess I get confused from, from my from from the, from the, from so the we, applicants. There was a, I'm, 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 I'm sorry about the confusion, but we had a, we just had a list of things that we're concerned about. So maybe that's less confusion. The, app, the open space is there. It's in but, that. It's, it's okay. There. But the question is, when you said you want to come up, I, I think we were having a discussion about deferral. You, you're not willing to defer. You're not going to ask for deferral. I'm willing to defer if, it, if it's up for denial, but I guess. So. It, it's just a shame. Okay. Yeah, I, one thing I, I and I can say, you know, having had some discussions around, you know, even Carlton views many, many, many months ago because the Department of Mental Health or what's well, not called that, Department of Behavioral Health these days has instituted some new funding options for people with disabilities. And I know that these kind of projects, in fact, I heard from the Faison group last week, um, these things are so complicated and, and pull in so many different pieces of funding. Um, and it's not, the, it's not the developer or the agency's response fault. It's just that it's so hard to grab that, that federal money and other mm -hmm. local monies and things like that to make these things work that it becomes very complicated. Now, I'm not saying that's a reason right. to approve or deny. I just understand the, the complexity of right. trying to piece these things together. And the, and the least little thing just knocks the whole thing out of orbit. And it's just, you know, it's one of those things that I'm weighing myself yes. in terms of this. And again, I think part of it's going to come back to is 
you know, do we trust the developer to do some of the things that we really want to see happen with it um, or not? Yeah. I'd like to make a motion to, Fantastic. to accept the applicant's deferral. I don't think I heard the applicant say he is offering a deferral. Mm -hmm. He said it was preferable to denial, so maybe you need to well, I haven't poll heard of the commission. <laughs> Okay, so what we'll do is let's, uh, Mr. Lahandro. Well, I'm going to make a motion, but it's going to not to be denied. Okay. Um, I move to recommend denial of this application to rezone the subject properties from M1 to PUD on the basis that the proposal would not service the interests of the general public and good zoning practice. We have a motion. Do we have a second? You died. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, so I would take that as you would vote for denial. Yes. Uh, or to recommend denial. Let me let me make sure I've got the wording correctly. Ms. Keller, right now, if we voted, would your would recommended be denial or approval? Well, I, I know what you want. Right. But if we voted now, it would if be we voted now, I would hate to do it, but I would vote for denial because I don't think it's realized its potential. And uh, I don't know who else was on the design team, but I, uh, I don't know that the, this has had benefit of architectural or landscape architectural services, and I think probably uh, having a more design input would make it better, so, uh, so I would vote against it. Okay. I, I, I'll tell you, this, this is probably gonna be a first, but I'll tell you, if I had a vote for <laughs> denial or approval, I probably would say I would extremely reluctantly approve it, um, which would probably put me in the minority. I would probably prefer to deny it or see a deferral happen. Really, I'd like to see a deferral, but somebody's going to have to deal with this. I, I think it's a, I just think it's a, yeah, right. I can't, I'm having trouble separating the affordable <laughs> housing out from everything else. I am too. Yeah. Uh, I'd vote for denial. You would vote for denial. That means I don't have to tie break. No, you don't. We have a motion for deferral. Was it seconded? There, the, no, he I'm said he wanted make. a motion for, to accept the applicant's deferral, but I did not hear the applicant ask for deferral. Mm. Um, so is that on the table? Would you like to? Yes, thank you. I would accept the uh, deferral this time. Okay. Then I'll, I will second. The motion, the motion for, for accepting the uh, applicant's deferral from Mr. Keyseeker and a second from Ms. Keller. Do we have any more discussion on this? I, okay. Well, I think I, the discussion is that I that I really hope that it will come back addressing these concerns, and I think we it would be good to try to work with the applicant and staff, making sure that we have this list of our enumerated concerns tonight, especially because we would need that as a guidance document for the four individuals who will be considering it next time who aren't present tonight. Well, you all you all noted, just, just to clarify, very um, broad topics here. So um, I, I'm not sure that staff would be able to, to necessarily provide detailed guidance on some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, if you all want to provide more detailed guidance to the applicant concerning some of these topic areas, that might be helpful. Um, we'd like more connectivity within the complex, more innovation, uh, open space uh, within the complex, um, and to have it um, uh, operate as a unified uh, development. Could, could I ask you, in all fairness to the applicant, I'm so sick of the word innovation. What the heck does that mean? Does anybody ever know what that means? Can we provide some guidance on what the heck innovation means? Well, it means more than just blocks of large buildings. There you go. For us, that's what that's going to mean for this. <laughs> In terms of this project, that's what it means okay. to me. I okay. Can't speak better that's, than that's, else. that's better than just the word innovation. Um, and that's pedestrian connectivity. Right. 
And I'm not sure if the applicant can find out from transit, like, what are the options there to, to look at the CAT service? And it's right. It, it's hard to burden them with that right. because it's really outside right. their mm -hmm. area of responsibility. I do right, know that there's an open meeting for CAT. I just got an app. Uh, I'll tell you, I've just got an invite for that. And, and I, I'm well aware that two thirds of the site's already built up. Um, it's, it's limited opportunity. But I think even with the third that's left, something more innovative mm. and something more pedestrian connected and open spaced and thoughtful uh, can be done. Yeah, you know, I will say that just a kind of a comment, and this kind of is similar in, in certain ways, just that it started out as one project and it comes back to us as a PUD. I think we had the same thing happen elsewhere in Belmont where the developers started mm -hmm. um, under a certain type of development and then came back to us after all the trees were down and everything <laughs> and basically asked for a PUD. And I think that that's one of the problems I've always had with the PUD is that you know you can still back into a PUD even after you've started it as another project and all of a sudden things have changed. And that doesn't mean that they're not trying to do the right thing and all, but it's just so difficult when we when we allow that to happen, which is some of the discussion we had over getting rid of the PUD completely. Though, quite honestly, I think if we did some really innovative things with the PUD regulations, we could make it work much better for what we want it to be creatively. But I really do have a problem when we allowed folks to back into the PUD project after it started out under an SUP or something else just because it doesn't work any longer under that previous zoning that was requested. I, I, that's, a, that's a conversation you guys can have in the future. I'll probably come back and remind you <laughs> about well, I don't those know. things. I, but I would take exception to the we allowed. Um, we we didn't even know. Uh, <laughs> right, right. How can we allow it? Well, but, but I mean, I think it's the kind of thing where it's not like they, they can request it. I guess we can just say, we could say no as the Planning Commission. No, you started right. off as an SUP. And that's what you've got to follow, and you have to go there. We make that recommendation to council. You just follow the zoning that you put in the place originally or so. Well, you know, taking, right? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm not sure if we're backing into a PUD. I mean, I think at this point, this is the only other option. And, and is that a, a well? It's not the only other option. They could that... they could still develop the property under the original SUP. Well, they are. They already are. They're they're coming forward with this request for additional density. The only mechanism right. that we were able to help them find in our zoning code Is would be PUD. the PUD. Uh, um, and otherwise, they would have to stay under the otherwise parameters they, they of the SUP. Couldn't do, Right. Well, yes, be done. they couldn't do any mm -hmm. any more yeah. density, and so that is what they are requesting to do. And we're through stage one, oh, no, no, and I, I we'll think see right. see what occurs. Um, but you know, they they were very limited in in what the mechanism might be, and um, you know, just to note, this site is crazy, um, and the fact that they've been able to do this with this site and and this hasn't been an easy feat has you know it, right there's a lot to I, that as well so there, that's where that innovation comes in right and it, that that goes back to, to the limitations the project, of our existing when zoning. the project was first being rezoned would it have been better off to be rezoned as a pud right from the get-go well they didn't know how it would evolve well, i mean yeah. you, you just don't know these right. things so uh, I, i'm gonna yeah. let, let's let's not digress on this we have a motion in a second i do want to uh I, I guess the question would be um i mean i don't know if the applicant wants to do a work session uh at this point or if this is enough uh, but yes, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we did have a pretty good packet, pretty detailed and pretty yes. thorough. Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. So we appreciate the work on that for certain. Yeah. That has not gone unnoticed I think the, for certain. The other thing that it, I'm not sure is on your list, I think it was a good point about the, the food desert. Um, and while we can't, mm -hmm. you know, right. guarantee the success of a, of a grocery store or a convenience store, Perhaps that is a place where there could be some kind of innovation that mm -hmm. provides uh, some some response beyond physically putting a store there. And right. I would like to see something address that because you have a vulnerable population at the edge of the city. 
and no place even for those people who are very mobile to to right. find affordable and good food. So that would be something I'd like to see addressed. And and maybe talk to the people who are 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 already living there mm -hmm. to see what would be helpful for them already as residents before you expand a potential maybe already problem. Maybe a, a like a smaller community meeting yeah, or, with those particular residents. Right, you know, or maybe it's a farmer's market or mm -hmm. it, a, a pop-up market right. on some kind of basis. I don't and know. that is still in that matrix, if y'all remember that. We have a motion and a second. Thank you all yeah. for all of your patience. Yeah. Ms. Creasy, would you, you call a roll? Um, and this is a motion to accept the deferral yeah. Yeah. by the applicant. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Lahundra? Aye. Ms. Keller? Aye. Mr. Santowski? Aye. Mr. Kiesecker? Aye. And Ms. Green? Aye. A motion, motion for deferral has passed. To and accept I think the deferral. Def to accept the deferral. I think it's really important for us to articulate that this was not intended as anything to oppose affordable housing, but that it was to encourage better affordable housing. Yes. Well, okay. Well I'm going to recommend we take a 10 minute break uh, because we still have two entrance corridor things to review and a couple of other things uh, on the agenda, not to mention a preliminary discussion. So be back please at 835.